And there it is. We are back again. We were actually back yesterday, technically, uh, but then there were some some errors, and so we're given this. We bumped it to today. So welcome back to the Funderground. Uh, we have some format changes. Um, let's see. So we're going to start now with news, followed by uh, what we're calling Funderdogs, which are uh, campaigns that we feel need a little more love, uh, as opposed to just, instead of just showing you everything that looks cool, uh, we've singled out uh, several campaigns that need a little bit more love, followed by the pick, and then we will do uh, the more general format where I take a look, they're my choices, the max selects, just which is just general campaigns uh, that I think are interesting, that you might want to back they don't quite need as much love some of them don't really need much at all and then we'll do a little check-in with uh previous pick of the week and then we'll go into the super funds uh but first i suppose we're supposed to oh when i switch the side so you may even see me glancing a little more towards the camera than often than previously so <clears throat> first up we have the news oh my goodness so some moving and shaking in the the world of board gaming this week. Uh, I have notes. <clears throat> um, all right, so we'll start with uh, everyone knows probably that Disney Lorcana. Uh, some there were previews put out and some of the content was leaked. Uh, it's basically going to be a a competitor to Magic the Gathering. Now, this isn't really news. Everybody's known about Lorcana coming out for months now. But the leak was uh, new this past week, uh, and we got to see uh, some of the stuff in action. Cards look great. Visually very appealing. Um, has a has a strong Magic the Gathering kind of vibe to the layout, but, I mean, they kind of set the standard, right? Uh, the one thing, though, <clears throat> that I found interesting, uh, I saw a commentator, and they had a really great point. And that is, you know, uh, the question was, is there space for yet another collectible card game? Uh, obviously, it has a greater chance of success since it is Disney, but it doesn't have Star Wars so far, at any rate. And also their Fantasy Flight, and I doubt it will uh, so long as Fantasy Flight maintains that license because they're releasing their own trading card game based on Star Wars. You know, because the first time wasn't enough. Um, so, when posed that question, you know, is there space, uh, they had a really interesting take, and I wish I could remember who it was. Uh, I was on some podcast, and their take was that, well, there's space for Pokemon which is not a, really a hard competitor for Magic, but it has uh, a very strong fan base that mostly treats it like a collection. So, yeah, people play it, but it nearly as strong as the, or even stronger than, <clears throat> the competitive element of Pokemon is the collectible element. And that, I think that that cut right to the heart of it. That is that is the space in which Lorcana will exist. It is not just a... Uh, a collectible card game battler uh, directly, you know, direct competition but it's also something that people will collect because it has great art and it has all these characters that people love so uh, I think that it I don't know, Disney has a Disney products have a habit of not lasting uh, they had an online game that now a uh, sorcerer something, which was then converted to a board game, and for that board game, there's now three expansions, and it's a, it's like a um, an arena brawler, and it has some interesting ideas and interesting art. Except it's all of all of the different kinds of art, whether it's you know uh, I should say all the different properties in Disney that it makes use of, regardless of their art style or whether they were live. Uh, live action films, they've all been uh, translated into this one particular style of art. So that has, I don't know, there's there's a, a consistency, at least, to the appearance of all of the cards. The game itself I've never played. 
seems interesting. You pick like three characters, sort of like a not quite a tag team match, but they're all in there, and you and you shuffle up. They each have uh, their own little mini decks. You shuffle them up, and then you battle it out with other Disney characters. But they all have certain types, you know. So there's like brawlers and spellcasters and so forth. Uh, it seems like it could be fun, but the the board itself is kind of dull. Off track. Anyway, Locan is coming, and it's probably going to have a space that it can rest in. So we'll be seeing Lorcana for a while, I imagine. Uh, next up on the news front is um, it's called Stronghold Games is the company. They are they currently have a live campaign which is actually going to be in the show later for monster hunter world iceborne which is a sequel to monster hunter world the board game and the board game is the adaptation of the video game monster hunter world and this campaign is the adaptation of the expansion to the video game expansion monster hunter world iceborne (laughs) that is We'll get deeper into that later, but uh, <clears throat> the news here is that uh, Stronghold Games quietly laid off uh, roughly 20% of their workforce back in March. And this is after uh, last year informing their staff that upcoming uh, salary reviews were put on hold, which I think that's... <clears throat> That seems shady, right? I mean, first of all, that's just letting you know, hey, by the way, your job's not secure. Uh, but also, like, just the idea that a company can just arbitrarily, like, we do we do salary reviews every year, right? Performance reviews. You know, until we don't. And then, sorry about your luck. I mean, look, unions are a good thing. I guess that's my point. Anyway, the in the process of... Uh, trimming down. Uh, so here's why I find this. Okay, there's a couple. There's a couple layers to this. First of all, if you recall, a few weeks ago, Mythic Games admitted that they had overhired, but then rather than firing a bunch of people, they, when they were in financial trouble, bringing out their next Kickstarter, which was Rainbow Six, they opted to ask the backers to contribute additional funds for shipping. Now, it's not good business, and it's not great offloading your mistakes onto the customers, um, but when you're faced with it, it's a similar scenario. So uh, Stronghold Games, their most recent campaign before Monster Hunter was Elden Ring, which was huge, did big numbers. Now, that that game uh, shipped, and they had the staff, but they opted to get rid of staff rather than worry about this next game that's coming out, Monster Hunter. Now, to be fair, Stronghold has several uh, video game IP board games that they have kickstarted, and it just looks like all of these large companies are all... They're all doing lazy Susan financing, which is where they they have a, a a new project, and the funding that comes in from that project is then rotated around to pay for the previous project. Which means they have to constantly have something coming up in order to pay for everything that's currently taking place. And that that makes sense in a in a more traditional product retail consumer scenario that you know pre-orders for this thing are going to pay you know your bills right now then that thing comes out uh then you get a little more you get another hit from retail and then you keep making the next product but that model doesn't really make sense when you're crowdfunding because you're literally stating with your campaign that this is what this costs this is what's a, this is what it's going to take to buy this thing. This will pay for everything, and then you'll get it. So if you 
have to ask for more money or you, uh, I mean, obviously there can be strange things that happen like, you know, the pandemic, but that doesn't count this time because Monster Hunters is now out. And even Elden Ring was out once we were aware of a lot of these changes in shipping and manufacturing. So again, I just, <clears throat> this is something that's going to become an issue moving forward. Uh, we're going to see more things like this, where these companies, they get big enough and they lazy Susan all of their content. And we know this is a fact because Stronghold Games entered into an agreement with Kickstarter to release their next four games on Kickstarter. Now, that obviously indicates that they are intending to continue to make more games. Sure, not a surprise. But it also means that this is that they are guaranteeing that they're going to do four more. So they, they are anticipating their ongoing Lazy Susan efforts. Uh, but they streamlined their personnel after the big one, I guess because they realized they're not going to do that again. I don't know. But this brings up a different question. Obviously there is a benefit to Kickstarter for uh, locking in four subsequent games in a row, particularly from a company that makes really popular campaigns. So right there, their benefit is, is locked in, right? That means that those games don't go to backer kit or game found. They stay at Kickstarter and then Kickstarter takes their cut. So, but then what is the benefit to stronghold? They were going to make those games anyway, right? And they're probably going to put them out on Kickstarter, probably. So what did they receive? And I don't know. Nobody has said anything. But here's my speculation. Oh, speculation. This isn't fact. This is just based on observation. I really think there's only two things that Kickstarter can offer a, uh, a company that wants to put a game out, uh, do it to run a campaign through Kickstarter. It's two things. They can, one, slap their Project We Love badge on it, which is almost a guarantee that the, that project will get funded. Because when people explore Kickstarter looking for things, if you just go with the default settings, uh, it'll be, you know, it's the category, then it's the location that the that the Kickstarter creators is running the campaign and then the last one there's only so there's three possible uh here let me why don't i just show you <clears throat> oh i gave the game away i revealed what the first thing was my bad um <laughs> that's not a big deal hold on um let me see let me let me set it up in advance. There's a brilliant idea. What about that? So, if I here we go. So here is uh, tag nabbit. There we go. <clears throat> okay. So as you can see up here, uh, it's not going to show you everything. We'll figure this out. But you see, here's tabletop games. And then projects on Earth. And you can change that to United States. Uh, comics. Crafts. These are the, the, the categories. And then this final category that you can't actually see over here. Is it's the default is magic. Which if you can tell here. I'm sure you can. Uh, we got a project we love. And you can see over here there's a little edge of the project we love badge. And then this one right here. Monster Hunter. It has the project we love. Oh look. Project we love, project we love, project we love, project we love, project we love. So you see the magic? Does the magic seem magical? Or does it just seem like they front load all of the projects that they consider worth backing? So there's the benefit to Stronghold. They're going to get a, uh, a guaranteed badge and... I mean, obviously, you can sort by a way a means other by magic. Like when I uh, do research for this, I set it by newest. And the other options are popularity, newest, end date, most funded, most backed, close to me, stuff like that. So, 
That's the one thing they can offer them. The other thing they can offer them is, obviously, to reduce their fee. So, Kickstarter takes 5% of the total funding. So, if they take 3% of the total funding, sure, they're taking less, but 3% of four guaranteed games is a lot more than 5% of games that went over to GameFound. So... Uh, that's that is my belief. I think that they basically negotiated that they get a project we love badge and they get a lower fee. So, I mean, it is what it is. But it once again demonstrates that when you're <laughs> when you're already making money, uh people want a piece of that, so they help you make more money. It's just the way it works, I guess. But that's what we're here at the Funderground to try and do is help the little people get a little bit of that, uh, the piece of that pie that they deserve. So let's go into the final piece of news. And this one's a big one. This went everywhere. Um, there was, there's a game called Aeon's Trespass that is currently being, uh, has a campaign. And there is a content creator who, uh, a board game content creator who regularly makes reviews and previews. They reached out to this company. Um, okay, I want to I make this very succinct. The accusation, the, the tragedy, whatever, it, is that uh, everyone th- is of the opinion that this creator blackmailed the uh, game designer. Game designers, it's a company. Uh, blackmailed the company by stating, hey, we will, if you give us money, we'll make new content about your game. But if you don't, then we're going to push out all of the stuff we already did, which doesn't look so great for you, for the game. And there's definitely, there's definitely room to perceive it like that. Now, I personally don't think that that was the intent. I read the emails uh, because <laughs> they were released. And what it really boiled down to was that the content creator uh, made some videos about how to play and, you know, some breakdowns and kind of a review. And they encountered trouble learning how to play the game. And so before they published it, they went to the creator and to the design company and they said, hey, if you want to work with us, can you you can send us somebody to walk us through this so that we can do a much better interpretation of this game and you know but it can be sponsored content that way uh they can okay so this is where it gets a little weird so they stated that there's that typically sponsored content on their channel charges x and we're going to charge you x minus y and the company was like, well, even X minus Y seems a little high, uh, but we'd be willing to move forward with this. You know, you know, we'll start with one video. And then it was some back and forth. Uh, so here's what, okay, big overview. This, this content creator made a bunch of videos already, right? So they put in the time and the effort, okay? So that's like, okay, well, you know, I feel if somebody put in a lot of time and effort into creating something and then they want to make a better version of it, you know, if, if the company wants to come in and, and make a better, improved version, then it seems reasonable that they could sponsor that. However, the content creator claims they put they have like 50 hours worth of work into it. And that's where we got to pump the brakes. If you get 50 hours into content creation and you still don't know how to really play the game, it's not on the design company to pay you for your time. <clears throat> you stop what you're doing and you reach out and start from there. Say, hey, we were going to make a thing. It wasn't working out. Let's start a relationship. You can sponsor. That would have been a much better way to go. And even though, and even if you did, I'm sorry. <coughs> even if you did make the content, don't bring it up. Because there's no way to interpret, hey, we got all this stuff over here that doesn't look great for your game, and we really don't want to put it out, but if you don't want to work with us, then we're going to have to put this out, because that's all we have. 
despite that being an accurate assessment, it just has a... You got a nice place here. It'd be a shame if something were to happen to it kind of vibe, you know? Um, or for you Always Sunny fans, it's the implication. So that's that's my big problem with it is is things went too far before the uh, attempt at reaching out was made. If they had done that dramatically earlier, then all this uh, jockeying for the cost and what to do, like, because then there were accusations that they were only willing to sponsor if the uh, if the coverage was positive, right? So basically, they're paying for a positive review, right? And it's like, well, yeah, but if you're paying money, you're going to pay for somebody to dump all over your the thing you made. That doesn't make any sense. Who would do that? So, so anyway, <clears throat> the real problem was not coming to the game creator earlier before you you made anything um then the second failure was to then let them know that you had done that like that's just a thing you just got to eat if you're gonna if you're so once you start this discussion hey we want to work with you because we can't really understand it as soon as that discussion starts, you cannot talk about anything that you've created or anything that you've done that is a bad version of that. And you also, you're in a bad place now because you can't really then go, well, if you don't want to work with us, then we'll just do our best, right? Because now, if, if you don't come out with a glowing review, then you could still make the accusation that you basically were blackmailing them. So... It's, it's just a bad look overall. I do want to state, so that's, so we're done. But as somebody who works in uh, television production professionally, uh, I, w- I will tell you the cost that they quoted was $1,500 over four videos. Uh, but, or so many videos with a, with a grand total of $7,000 for the content. And they balked at that number, and then the content creator said that uh, typically they would charge twenty five hundred. Now it sounds like a lot, sure, but coming from production, uh, fifteen hundred dollars for say a thirty minute instructional video is insanely cheap. I mean, if 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 I were doing this professionally with a crew, you know, somebody handling the lights, me on this, and then. Uh, you know, some kind of technical help, you know, someone running the camera, we'll say, uh, that would be, a, that would be a very small shoot. Just paying the three of us for a day's work would be at the bare minimum 500 a piece. So 1500, just for us to be here and do our job that has nothing. And that's bottom of the barrel rates. Then you got to bring in, the, is it going to take more than one day? of shooting. Uh, and then you got to have an editor and again, bottom of the barrel editing for eight hours would be 500, right? I mean, that's a guy that other editors are going to be pretty pissed that he's taking that rate. So $1,500 for a 30 minute piece of video, you know, professionally produced. That's honestly dirt cheap from the world of production that I know. I know YouTube's a different beast, and I think that's kind of where things get a little weird. Uh, but I just wanted to point that out that uh, if you can get if you can get a thirty minute ad for your game for fifteen hundred dollars, I mean, I swear to you, every company every company that advertises on television, if they find out about that, <laughs> wait, we could pay fifteen hundred dollars and we can have a thirty minute ad. Are you what? I mean, that's fifty million dollars. Not really. I mean, it would cost you over a million dollars if you think about a, a fully fleshed out. Pro- anyway, I'm going way off the track. All right. So, yeah, I didn't even talk about like renting equipment. Like that would have been a factor, right? Because you got to have the cameras, you got to have the lights, you got to get the mics. Like that's that. Just the the can the equipment rental alone would have been close to a grand for those minimal elements. And I once again went off track. So, <laughs> let me stop going off track, uh, and we're gonna jump into. Our Thunderdogs, yes. So, uh, as with the new format, uh, we are now going to do this. Uh, we're going to run through all of the um, uh, all the, 
the, the choices for uh, campaigns that w- we feel should get a little extra love, you know, because they're doing something good. So this is our first one. Um, and you'll see down there in the corner, Thunder Dog, which is something I'm going to have to remember to remove when we switch off of this, which I'm guaranteeing I'll forget. Anyway, <clears throat> so our first one up is Time Warp Warriors. Uh, this, is a, this is an interesting little thing. Oh, I'm sorry. There's one other element that I, I, is going to be introduced from here out. Each, uh, each week we're going to focus on something, an element of a campaign and how it's done right or wrong. And so this week we're going to focus on the top of the, the page, which would be the description, the image, and then the first thing that happens in the campaign. So right here we have Time Warp Warriors, the two-player meeple rolling fighting game. So Time Warp Warriors, uh, it, so you roll meeples. So right there, that's new. Not dice, meeples. <clears throat> you create combos. Uh, the, the point of the game is to... Uh, defeat your opponent by either diminishing their health or knocking them off the edge. But right here <clears throat> at the top, here we go. Across the top, we see <clears throat> Time Warp Warriors. This is really well done. Immediately from the the title, we know exactly what it's about. We got the name and we got a description. Then we got a slightly more colorful description. Then we got an image. Okay, now here's the thing. There's two schools of thought. Uh, a lot of people believe you need a video. Uh, you got to have a video up top to sell your thing. <clears throat> no, you don't. People know how to read. Okay. If they can get to your campaign, then they know how to read something. And uh, a video is a tricky thing. Well, yes, it would be nice to have video. If it's not a great video, then you, you're better off with just an image. Um, my personal preference is is for a static image. I'm not saying this is the way to go on Kickstarter. I don't, in fact, it's it's more than likely that having a video, if it's a good video, is going to be more helpful to you because you, like right here at the top of the page, uh, you get everything out to the people, right? <clears throat> I hate it because one, I'm going to go through this page. There's plenty of space for you to hit me with your videos, okay? And in general, I don't like watching videos when I'm trying to learn something about... I mean, videos are good for learning some things, but a lot of stuff, I just want to read it because I absorb it better when I can see it. And it lets me track, you know, back, you know, to check something that I missed, whereas that's harder to do on a video. Uh, Anyway, also, I don't like a video at the top because it puts this big old green square in the middle of the image. So I don't even get a full clean image. Um, but again, like I said, uh, for, for your campaign, having a high quality video up at the top is the best. Then the next best would be to have a great image. You know, something that really shows off what you have. And then well below that is a crappy video. All right. And then the next thing is what do they do right at the top? And they, these guys did a great job. They got some good art. They have, uh, they, they show more of the game and they give a description, right? Choose your warrior, roll your meeples, chain combos. I mean, it's really just regurgitating what's at the top. It'd be nice if it was a little different, but it's still content directly related to the game itself and how it's played. Okay. The worst mistake people make is at the top of their Kickstarter, they go into some beleaguered tale about how they got here and dude we don't care you want us to buy your stuff show us your stuff we'll worry about your you know personal life experiences towards the bottom of the page once i know if i even have an interest in your product to begin with but don't sell me your sob story before i even know if i have an interest in what you made um i'm not trying to be mean i'm just saying that No one, no one really, people are more invested in your story when they care about what you're showing them, uh, what the, the product that you're trying to get them to buy. So these guys, so we're done with the review portion of the campaign, uh, for the game itself. Okay. There's two things that I really like about it. This meeple thing, rolling the meeples is great. So if they land on their feet, it's a punch. If they land on their side with their feet up, it's a kick. And if they land with their head touching the ground, then it's a jump kick. What a neat idea, right? 
finally, meeples have a purpose beyond place owning. Uh, and also, you'll notice that these meeples are, they have a, a specific design, and that is based on the actual characters. I think it'll show you. So, uh, so big hat guy here has a big hat, right? And then dome head has a dome. And I think, yeah, this horns person with the holding the flag has horns and has the arm out. And then this guy's pretty standard. But you notice doesn't have legs, you know, has this vaporous apparition. Oh, Ghostbusters reference. Um, so this <clears throat> so what that does, I think, is that would probably weight this character in a way, this meeple in a way that it's rarely going to do a jump kick. So you're probably going to get punches and kicks more often. Whereas, and then same with this, uh, depending on the side, but because this is up here, if it lands on the backside, it's probably more likely to be a jump kick. So you see what I'm saying? Like the shape of these things kind of affects how they roll. Uh, the shadow meeples are this really interesting concept. If you take damage, <clears throat> a shadow version of your future self comes back to help you. I mean, you could not get better sci-fi than that. Uh, let's real quick, let's take a look at the uh, the levels of the campaign. So, <clears throat> we have a couple here, right? So, this was the uh, early bird. So, here's the basic pledge. 50 bucks. You know, that's not bad. And you're getting some interesting stuff here. Uh, there is... So the game's pretty straightforward. Uh, you knock. Let's go back up. You knock your your enemies. You you and your enemies start on either side, and you got to you can attack them for damage. You can hit them to push them back, and if you push them off the edge, you win uh, sumo style. Now, <clears throat> one the other thing I like besides the meeples is acrylic standees. Oh man! Now the only thing they're not showing us here. And I didn't. I wasn't able to find any imagery of it anywhere. Is what the backside looks like. However, if you just look at the way these things are cut out, I mean, it could go either way. The best version, and we're gonna do a little show and tell uh, for that. Hold on. The best version of an acrylic meeple is. See if I can do this. It was like this. Let me get away. There you go. So here we got Cyclops, right? Okay, nice, nice thick edge here. But Cyclops, when you spin him around, it's Cyclops back. Come on, how awesome is that? This, <coughs> this tells you how much I love these things. I, I've had this for weeks. And I haven't punched these out because it's just so pretty. I love this thing so much. So, okay, so here we go. Here's my sacrifice for the channel, right? I'm going to... Let's pop one out. Oh. See, and this is a really nice touch. They got this laminate on here to keep everything in place so that it won't fall out during shipping. That's brilliant. Oh. Oh, there it was. Wait, here. You... <clears throat> oh, you peeling junkies you ready there it is oh does that make you happy does that do something for you all right let's pop magic out here <clears throat> this is magic with a k oh yeah nice both sides oh you get a little you get a little extra asmr here we go oh no it's it's two-sided oh this is this is going to be the perfect little peel for all oh, you freaks out there that love this here we go we've broken the seal here it goes all right get ready are you ready for this oh there it was all right so we got storm <clears throat> so storm right that's not focusing i'm sorry it can't focus. It's too close. Oh, but trust me, it's Storm. So there's Storm. And then it storms back. <clears throat> so, 
for this, they could do that. However, they really could just mirror the image on the back. And if they do, I'll be a little disappointed. Won't be my favorite, but oh, it's just so nice, nice and thick. And also, what's great about this is it's flat. It goes it goes into your box easy. Uh, also, the bottom when you put it into a stand because this is acrylic. It doesn't wear down. Like if you put when you put the little stands on a plastic, I mean, I'm sorry, onto paper standees uh, or board standees, it wears down the bottom because the bottom is held like with uh, little pressure points. And if you keep popping that stand off and on to get it into the uh, box, you wear that away. So this isn't going to wear away. I mean, or if it does, man, that's a really tough base. Um, but it also goes flat, so it can go away. Oh. This is a really nice thickness, too. really like that. Anyway, sorry. So, getting back to Time Warp. Uh, so, another great feature of this is right here. <clears throat> so, on your play area, you have uh, your punch, your kick, your jump kick, and move, right? And, that, and you can do that uh, based on... Here you go. So, you put a meeple there to indicate that that's what you're doing okay now here's the thing uh and i think you get little cards or something so but what this does this unlocks this ability to go into that punch slot so this card could be put down here under the punch slot for you to activate it however you don't get to do that so these cards you draw them you don't get to do that until you roll this combo and then you pay for the com pay for the card by with this combo so over here you can see that they're basically saying you have to have one punch and then you can have one of anything else so a punch a kick a jump kick or laying flat oh yeah and laying flat i can't remember is that defending Cra oh no it allows you to move um so once you've unlocked it then you can add it in Great idea. So not only do you have these very interesting ways to uh, determine what attack you're taking, you can then enhance the attack and your and your characters evolve over the course of the game. Um, and as I said, if you get damaged, you can call in reinforcements from your future self. Eventually, you're supposed to fight off a boss, and you do that by... Uh, this is sort of like a tourney system. Now, here is my one issue with the game. And that is, you roll your meeples behind a screen. Now the purpose for that is so that it, your opponent won't know what your future moves will be, right? They have no idea what's possible. You know, they, like, because uh, you can also defend in this game, and there's uh, two ways to defend. There's, uh, or maybe three, but one is to just completely block the damage. That's it. However, any effect that is uh adjacent or or side side saddle with the attack so getting dazed getting pushed back that still happens to you then there's another one reflect where you take the damage but you reflect the the extra ability back at your attacker and then i guess the last defense is you can like defend and move forward maybe push them back i don't really know i didn't read the all every single element of this thing um, but my problem with the screen, while it's good for making sure that your opponent doesn't know if you're capable of defending this round, the downside is, is it's, it's asking you to trust your opponent a heck of a lot. Um, I think I was thinking about this. I think really the only solution that would make sense, um, if you're going to keep the screen is, or to make the screen have a. Okay, so what you basically need is you need something to lock in the the meeples. So either, you know, cover them with a clear cup of some kind so that you can't touch them. That way you know then that, that they're not, you know, because think about it. When you go to pick up the meeple to show them what the move is, you could rotate it, right? So if you have like a clear, something clear so that you could see your meeples and know what you have available to you, but it also keeps you from touching them. Right. And then you just play your whole hand, your whole round. And then at the end, you can check each other to be like, 
okay, you did have the meeples to make those moves, right? And then you're good. <clears throat> just my suggestion. Um, because this right here, <clears throat> I'm just going to tell you, my six-year-old has a real habit of picking up a die to move it, and suddenly it's a new face, right? So <laughs> I'm not accusing everybody of cheating. I'm just saying sometimes if you knock something over and it's conveniently in a better position, some people might take advantage of that. Uh, but this is a it's a neat little game. Uh, it plays pretty quick, and I really like the 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 upgrades and the uh, acrylic standees. Overall, it's a good job. I like this one. Go ahead and back it. Fifty bucks. All right. Next up, <clears throat> we have <coughs> Slackjack. Hoy. Now, I'm trying to make sure that I do all this correctly now. So there we go. Look at that. It is Slackjack. And it's a Funder Dog. So, <clears throat> now they have reached their funding goal, which is good. But, you know, 5000 isn't a lot. So let's help them out if we can. So let's take a look. Let's do the review of their what they did. Slackjack, a pirate game of bluffing, bluffing and deception. Okay. Um, they don't mention that it's a card game, but then they say 10-minute game of blackjack and social seduction. Social deduction. Social Seduction would be a very different game. So, and they got a video. Uh, I suppose we could cue it up, see if it's a decent video. What do we got here? We got some animation. We got some live. <clears throat> we got a breakdown. We got a continued breakdown. It's only a minute long. <clears throat> That's not bad. So, then let's go down to, here we go. Yeah, good description, showing the game. <clears throat> well done, guys. While we're here, let's take a look at the levels. So, this game has... Okay, this one's a little weird. Uh, it's $9 for the base game, which is a pack of cards. Uh, then you get $19, which gives you the... And this is actually the one I recommend, um, because it gives you the cards, um, and then it gives you... This, these are advanced character cards, which add some wrinkles to the gameplay that I really think push it over the top to a, a really special place. Um, then you got the $29 one where you get metal coins, and oh, I know I'm a, a junkie for that, but I'm going to have something to say about that in a minute. Um, but overall, uh, $19 is a great, that's, that's a really good price point. Um, okay, so let's take a look at the game. So the basic premise here is that you are a captain and there's a crew and you have to take some of your crew with you in order to uh, collect the treasure, right? You, you're on, you're after the booty. So what, so the captain then allows the crew to lobby him to be a part of his expedition crew, right? So everyone draws two cards. They pick one, and they discard the other one, uh, except for one special card, the Slackjack. If you draw that, you have to play it. Um, and then, so, the so okay, it's like Blackjack because you want to reach the closest to 21 without busting wins. Because after the captain selects a crew... Uh, there's the crew that remains then becomes mutinous and they are rooting for the failure of the captain because then they get the gold. So, but in order for the captain to choose a crew, he uh, basically asks each person, why should you be on my crew? And you can say or do anything in order to get onto his crew. Okay. And so the cards have, you know, number values, uh, you know, like it shows here, standard, it's a standard deck, right? It has the suits, you know, we got the clubs, diamonds, hearts, spades. And so, so it's just like blackjack. And so if you have like, you know, a 10 king queen, you're, you're obviously going to push. You're be like, Hey, I'm a 10. Like, Oh, you only need one of me. And that means fewer of us share the gold. Right. So if we get two tens. You know, I mean, it'll be, they'd be pretty hard pressed. And depending on how many people are there, you know, it's how whoever gets closest. And so if you only have four, you know, like five or six people playing, if you only have five people playing, 
I mean, I don't know what the rules are for how many people you're allowed to select to come with you, but I imagine it's limited. You can't take everybody. Um, but <laughs> what's great about it is um, sometimes if you make the team you're on fail, you get gold. So there's these betrayers in the midst. And that and the slackjack is, is the one about that. That whoever the slack whichever team the slackjack is on, if he can if that team loses, the slackjack gets the gold. But then there are other uh, special abilities like, you know, you'll get extra gold if they're on the team or or the other team will get gold if they're on your team. Like there's all these crazy little extra um rules that you get only if you only if you back the 19 level to get these special character cards and the rest of the time it's you know just generic cards um another really great feature because this clearly already it sounds like a drinking game i know you can feel that but what really sells that point (laughs) is that they're plastic cards it's like uh too many bones like you're not going to make a mess you're not going to ruin these cards when you spill your you know your bottle of rum. Uh, it's this is just straight up. Uh, let's go drinking and talk a bunch of smack at each other to try and conv- you know beat each other to the booty. Um, now here is the one place where this game, this campaign, not the game, game's great, uh, where the campaign let me down. And it's not it's not a knock against the campaign. Like I'm, I still think this is a, a great concept and. You know, if I actually had enough friends to play it, I'd get it. Um, the my issue is right here. This was this is a missed opportunity. Now it doesn't state anywhere that this is a, a placeholder or that you know the this image, the design is subject to change, which is unfortunate because seriously, this is our Goonies moment. It's a doubloon, Ma. Right? Let's make make it a doubloon. I would. I would be instantly sold on this if these were doubloons, right? Or they just looked like old Spanish, you know, bullion. That would be the, oh, clinch. But like I said, missed opportunity. That's all. Um, and then you can just get a, apparently just a straight up regular poker deck with the the art and I'm assuming they're plastic too. That'd be kind of cool. All right. So yeah. Like this one, 19 bucks for the main pledge to get you all the stuff you need to really have fun with it. Uh, that's a bargain. Absolutely. All right. Please think about backing this one. <clears throat> Next up, we have hard level. Um, okay. There are... This is, this is unique in the Thunderdogs. So... Uh, this is this is this campaign brought back. Uh, I actually recommended this <laughs> campaign um, two weeks ago, I think. And so essentially what happened was the creator got feedback and agreed with the feedback and decided to make changes. And that is absolutely what you want. Didn't forge on or try and, you know, patch it after the fact. This guy just straight up said, this person, i got to stop doing that. This person uh, clarified the, their intent. They wanted to make a great game. And they wanted anybody who backed it to be happy. And this is what's incredible. Uh, not only did they, they came back with tons of good faith because, wait, hold on. Before we get into that, real quick. Hard level from the computer screen to roll and write gaming experience. Not the best description at the top. Uh, like it could be hard level, uh, print, and pray, uh, print, print and play roll and write. And then, you know, uh, you know, video game, video game comes to life. You know, it could be, this could be a little better, but it still does what it does. And then we got a video. I'm not going to play any more videos. That's, uh, that's not what I'm here to do. This is not a reaction channel. Um, but this, this image gives you uh, a great sense. You know, I like the little Game Boy Advance mock-up in the background there. And then, right off the bat, what is this game? Hard Level is a print-and-play board game. Boom. Now, I really feel that the print-and-play thing should be in the title. 
You know, so if you're starting your campaign, if you're making a print and play, you got to make that clear right off the bat. Because if people are coming in and they don't want to do, they don't want to print their own stuff, they're going to be discouraged by clicking on this and then realizing that there's not a print version. Um, so, you know, uh, allay those disappointments off the bat by stating print and play in your title. Uh, because that'll also pop up in the search. So you won't, you won't have anybody coming in disappointed off the bat. Now, <clears throat> but straight up, hard level is a print and play board game where you control a character in a stage like a console or PC platform game. And that's exactly what this is. All right. So we'll take a look at the pledge level. Now, here's where this guy, this person went to the next level. The pledge is a dollar less than it was previously. And as if that weren't enough, they also improved the character sheet. But trust me, if you go back to the previous one, uh, which, you know what? Why do you need to do that? I'll just show you in case you missed it. See, that's the beauty of the interwebs. <clears throat> so there is the previous character sheet. Serviceable, does what it needs to do, but kind of, you know, accountant-like. Pretty, you know, it's... A little dull. Also, what we'll point out here is episode one, Rise of the Necromancer. Um, that was, uh, I think that that was a post. All right. So the Rise of the Necromancer came as all these different uh, PDFs of different levels. Um, but it was a stretch goal, right? So that was the that was the hang up there. So Lizard King not only improved this character sheet dramatically. Doesn't that look much more appealing overall? And it feels like there's a little there's a little extra going on here with some like special abilities. Um, they also uh, included now. Rise of the Necromancer is just in the game. So they came back with a cheaper version with more content and a better design. That's how you treat your backers. This is fantastic. And it's four bucks. I mean, that's it. That's it. There's no other option. There's no there's no 10 tiers, which is another thing, but we'll talk about that in another in another stream. This is this is really just a textbook way to uh, to do the right thing, to do a great campaign. Uh, it is absolutely <clears throat> criminal that it only has seven hundred and fifty three dollars. Eighty nine backers is not shabby. I know that they're, they're not, you know, it's not an expensive tier, but still, this is. Uh, wow. I mean, come on, make a dream come true, guys. Let's just back this game i mean what it's not going to kill you it's 4 bucks and it make it would absolutely make this person's year you know get it get it up to a couple grand you know we only need like 100 more people 200 more people 300 400 600 get, let's get 1000 people on here you know um yeah back this game folks next up <clears throat> we have McBaron, Bravery in the Sky. Ooh so, this is another print and play. Um, it is set in World War I. It is crazy. I have never seen anything like this. Um, I have like a minor caveat for it, but let's start with McBaron, Bravery in the Sky. Okay, an action packed solo print and play war game. Fly over the battlefield, accomplish missions, improve your bravery. There you go. That is a solid description. Tells you what you're getting. The image, great. I like this. Really does good things for my design brain. This, uh, these opposing colors here, the 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 faded paper color, then a little bit of water. Oh, this is really good color scheme. Uh, did put a nice little overlay to make everything seem aged. Yeah, well done. So, what do we get right into? Straight up description. Here we go. Um, interesting that it's Dash McBaron. I'm wondering if that's just a design choice. 
for the title and they're incorporating it with text. It's interesting. Um, so, yep, you only need to print a couple sheets. Give yourself 20 minutes on the pencil. You're ready to face the battle. Fly it. Well, yeah, this is a really great uh, intro. So, pledge levels. We have $4 for for the PDF files of this game. And then uh, this is $6, and you get this racing game about which I know nothing. So, But here we go, folks. Yet two in a row, $4 print and play. I, I'm here for the bargains, apparently, this week. So here is the conceit about this game. <clears throat> you pick a location randomly on this sheet. You just... Drop your pencil somewhere. Then you roll a die. There's six possible binary missions. What You roll the die to, to find which column, and then you choose one of the missions, which is a target. Then you place the target, and then you guesstimate the distance in centimeters, which is going to be a problem for... Uh, you non-metrics, which, uh, of which I am one, but um, we don't use the, the king's measurements. Ugh. Anyway, uh, so you then you guesstimate the distance from the point where you dropped your pencil, which is your launch location, from there to the target. And the closer you are, um, the closer... So you have to be within a certain range, right, to be able to hit it at all. Um. But if you are right on top of it, really close, then you can just outright destroy the target. However, if you destroy the target, then you potentially take return fire and you have to roll to see that. Or you can opt to do a hit and run so it doesn't destroy it, but you also don't take return fire. Now, the other factor that you have to worry about when doing this are these concentric circles because these represent... Uh, perpetual anti-aircraft threat. So there's flat cannons somewhere making this a danger. So here's the thing. You get a random start point and then when it when you figure out where the uh, target is, you're going to have to fly through one of these zones probably. And so then that also uh, you, can, you can take only so much damage on your uh, character. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to drink water. Forgive me. <clears throat> I'm trying to reduce the ASMR this week. Uh, so, you can take only so much damage. Uh, you can deal only so much damage. You have <clears throat> a limited amount of ammo. And, I mean, that's basically the game. You gotta, you gotta try to destroy the most targets and take the least damage. That's it. But what's really cool is that it's unique every time. Like, where you start and where your target is, all that. The only... <clears throat> here's my one caveat... And it's just that I don't like so much the, you know, just, you know, close your eyes, swirl your pencil and drop it to figure out where. I think it would be a little more reasonable if there was like a grid overlay, you know, like a six by six. And then you have to roll two dice and then you get to pick, you know, you know how many across and how many down and that'll be your starting location. Then you can drop your pencil somewhere in there. I just, <clears throat> the, I don't know. There's just something that rubs me a little bit wrong about stabbing my pencil into a paper randomly with my eyes closed. I'm not, I, I feel like we could have a little more control over that, but that is really a tiny thought about this. Don't worry about that. It's not a big deal. That's just my personal thing. This is a great idea. Uh, it is, the, the rules were very clear. Um, the gameplay is gives you hard choices, right? What are you going to do? How are you going to fly? The only thing that I think might, like maybe in a future expansion, I guess, would be to have uh, altering flight paths. Like imagine how much more difficult it would be if you tried to avoid flak. You know, if you started here and your target is here, Right or like right there, so can you can you guesstimate what that line is to go around the flak? Because you can only make one turn. 
I mean, maybe you could maybe that you could house rule that to make things harder for yourself once you get really good at estimating distances. And I got to tell you, that is not easy for a lot of people. I used to play. Uh, what's the phrase? Uh, the game uh, X-wing miniatures, and you had to move and you had these little guides that you had to put down to move but you weren't allowed to put the guide down first you had to estimate in your head where you were going to end up and i always always got hosed by the three and the turnaround i could never I, for some reason i never it wasn't like the the it was the the hard three no no it was the the soft three the hard three was simple because it was sort of like a it was just like a a a 90 degree but the soft three curve oh could never figure out where the heck i was going to be that one hosed me so often so yeah uh gauging distances with eyeballing it on a sheet of paper as the the main gameplay conceit here is pretty interesting all right <clears throat> next up we have rust the afterworld okay so i am I'm breaking my own rule here. <laughs> I got a buddy. <clears throat> if he's watching this, he is uh he's screaming to the to the ceiling right now. Um because I am a funder dog this week is a collectible card game. After all my ranting, okay? So I just want to to Fables TSG just know it wasn't directed at you re- at that game at fables it what it really wasn't uh it was about ccgs in general and the just the nature of that business model okay <clears throat> doesn't mean i don't think ccgs are fun i i own them i mean okay my kid has pokemon uh, <laughs> but i used to play magic the gathering and i did a little uh werewolf um i think i did i did something else Oh, some Vampire the Masquerade. I mean, obviously, I'm dating myself heavily here because none of those other than magic have existed in decades. Um, I still actually have all my werewolf cards. Uh, I think so. Yeah, I think I saw them the other day, in fact. Um, So, let's do the breakdown. Rust, the afterworld, the kingdom. The ultimate post-apocalyptic experience returns in in this new standalone set. Bigger, better, and draftable. And here's the clincher. This right here is why I am uh, suggesting that this be backed. Okay, that, what that says right there. Now in reusable boosters, holy crap. Okay, so let's do the evaluation uh, okay, so this, okay, so the thing is, this is a solid uh, description, but it really kind of speaks to people who are already on board. Um, if you're not a, a, a CCG player, draftable and boosters, like, are, it's, you know, it's foreign language. Um, and it really doesn't tell you much else. Like, you know, is this a, uh, is this directly competitive? Is there a cooperative? Is it team based? Like this is this is not the best description. We could do better with this. Uh, the images, you know, services sh- showcases some great art. Okay, I love this albino tiger. That looks really good. Um, if I had any uh, improvement to recommend, it's that they need a little more drop shadow on the numbers because when the the background is lighter, they seem to get lost a little. Um, but I really like. You know, all the elements, you know, we got a little embossing, not like physical embossing, but like in Photoshop, that would be bevel and emboss right there. Um, That's really, and I mean, whoever the artist is, uh, they're good. I like it. It's got a little more, uh, well, basically, I'm not a big fan of apocalyptic, but like uh, apocalypse in the sense of, you know, a bunch of uh, Iron Maiden covers, essentially. (laughs) being the 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 presentation that's just not my style um but i think this is a really good job and again love that the art goes all the way to the edge so well well unfortunately they failed the final test here uh they did not start out by telling us about the game they start out by selling us on additions so that's not the best. Uh, also, 
why are you telling us that it's of its availability dates? Like, <laughs> this isn't a promo. This is the campaign. That doesn't. That seems like they recycled an ad that they were running on Board Game Geek into this. So here we get into the actual. Okay. So we'll talk about the game a little bit. I don't. I didn't get into it too deep, but I do like uh, two elements of it. Um, one. You have characters, uh, and you can pay extra to have minis. Um, and you heard the tone of my voice there. Again, it's not about this game. It's about minis. Uh, you have locations that you must defend, and then here is the hook for the gameplay, is that you can take on quests, and if you take on the quest, you basically depart the game board with whoever you send, and they go off and they handle that quest without any interference from the other players. However, if you take everybody, then there's nobody left behind to defend your locations, which I honestly don't know what the locations are. I mean, I imagine it's either this run of cards in the middle or, I mean, it could, no, it's probably the run of cards in the middle or maybe it's something in your, uh, in your play area. I don't know. Or maybe this is the location. So maybe you just, you, yeah, that makes more sense. You put them out. Anyway, if you don't defend the location, then... Other people can take it, and there are benefits to uh, owning the locations. So, I don't really know how it plays, uh, but apparently this is not their first go at this. Um, but this reusable booster thing, holy crap. Okay, when I did play Magic, my favorite thing to do was to do booster draft tournaments. So what you would do is you'd show up, you uh, paid a much higher fee than normal because you were also purchasing the cards. So you'd get one starter pack that had enough cards that it was a full deck. And I think with like a sideboard that you could use. And then you got two boosters and then you had 15 minutes to assemble a deck with those cards. And I, uh, and a lot of the tournaments, so in imagine you needed 60 cards to play. I don't know if you still do, but you did then you had to have a 60 card deck, but in the booster tournaments, the booster draft tournaments, uh, you played with a 40 card deck which really, you know, lets you narrow the focus. And then you're using random cards. You don't know what you're going to get. And you make the best thing you can, and you go up against everybody. And then when you win, you're allowed to take uh, so many cards from whoever you defeated. Um, obviously, enhancing your deck as you move forward. Uh, I loved that. It was really leveled the playing field. Then it, that made it... I mean, it was a little bit about luck, let's be honest. If somebody walked in, you know, if somebody... <laughs> unpacked a Sheevan Dragon, assuming they could even get it on the board, because it costs six. To, well, I remember too much. It costs six, and a lot of these uh, tournaments d didn't last into six rounds, uh, because you didn't have anything to really defend yourself, so you're just taking little, you know, if you got a fireball spell, which is one mana for three damage, like, you were almost guaranteed to win, because if you could find a way to recycle that thing, I mean, it's just an instant three hits, you know. Anyway, I'm sorry. Uh, I loved booster drafts because it leveled the playing field. It wasn't whoever had the most money to buy the most boosters to get the most rares and then come up with a crazy deck or just, you know, uh, recreate whatever, uh, deck was winning in the meta. Like it was just, how can you, how do you play? I mean, again, so many factors come in. You could get mana screwed. Uh, you know, you could just draw poorly and not get any of your creatures and then you just get rum rolled. But, I love this idea because this allows you to play booster draft tournaments over and over and over. They're reusable booster packs. So after you play, stick the cards back in, you know, or mix them up, right? Take, you know, put one rare or like make one booster have like three rares, you know, and then there's like three boosters out there that have none, right? There's so many things that you could do with this um, to make it a fun time. I really think that's great. Um, however, <laughs> uh, one box is $75 without shipping. Um, oof. And you're not going to want one. And the, only, the next level up is four boosters for... Oh, I'm sorry, I'm in your way. <clears throat> so the next level up is four boosters for $265. <sighs> so, uh, you know, if you're up for it, you know, I don't, 
normally this wouldn't be a funder dog conceptually, but for some reason, no one's getting into this. I mean, they're, they're funded, which is great. Good for them. Awesome. But it's only 27 people, you know, I mean, it is, it's not a cheap pledge. Uh, so if you're into this kind of thing, I got to say, this is one of the better, uh, CCGs I've seen, you know, better concepts for a CCG put out there, you know, you direct conflict and then indirect conflict and, uh, the, the ability to run a bunch of booster draft tournaments for fun. Oh, there's a lot of good stuff in here. All right, moving on. Next up is Flickade. <laughs> I like this. Uh, and I didn't set up. There we go. Flickade. <clears throat> so, all right, we'll do the we'll do the rundown. Flickade, tabletop game, family game. There you go. Experience an exciting, engaging game for those who enjoy flicking objects with precision and strategy. There it is, man. That is literally the game. There is very little complexity here. This is a bunch of uh, naval ships of different types that, I mean, really feel like they're plucked straight from battleship conceptually. You know, you got your aircraft carrier, you got your cruiser, you got your PT. Um, there's no submarine, though. Anyway, so comes in a little roll container here. Um, oh, wait, hold on. Introducing for K, my second ever game. for Okay. Okay, got in a little plug about himself there. That's fine, though. Uh, not a lot about the game, more about the campaign, but, you know, it could be worse. So, <clears throat> there are six left of the early bird, 25 bucks. You get two-player, which I don't really know how many you get. It's standard 30, and then... A four player for 45 now it seems clear that they're 3d printing these themselves as well as the case but i mean that's not a big deal uh this is literally a kid out here doing this right uh so good on you um so flicking includes 20 ships 10 okay so you get 10 ships per player so a four player is going to come with 40 ships um what I think is neat about this, aside from the simplicity, like this is a, an easy thing to throw out there on a table with a kid, um, is this expansion. So it introduces what appear to be submarines of some, you know, uh, but what what you notice here is they have a very low profile, right? But a very clear spot to flick them from, and that low profile is going to cut right under all of these aircraft carriers and basically any of the ships. Cause if there, there's one thing that's true that I saw in the, the images on this, like, I, I, yeah, I must've watched the video, um, is that when you flick these aircraft carriers, no matter how you do it, they're tumbling. Like these things do not end up seated prettily as the game progresses. They are all over the place, upside down and all that. But this ship has a better chance of actually going exactly where you need it and getting underneath something rather than tumbling over it, which there's actually a, uh, in the video, there's an example in this thing, uh, of someone who literally was about to just win it all. And they flicked their aircraft carrier too hard and it smacked the enemy, but because it was tumbling, it rolled over, it went off the table and they lost. Right. And that's why I like, I love the idea of pulling defeat from the jaws of victory. That's always fun in a game, I think, if that, yeah. And then the other element here, it's cool. These ships, when you hit them from the back, they break apart into two separate ships that count as two separate ships. But you can, like, basically you can do a 7-10 split, right? If you want to get two different ships at, at different angles. I think that's great. Um, yeah, so 25 bucks. This guy's, you know, good design, you know? Don't know if probably maybe had help who cares it's a fun idea and it's simple it's quick you can play with your kids you know nothing nothing wrong with that scenario i'm liking it next up we have ppl war reimagined um okay this is literally war reimagined okay a player versus game 
packed with strategy, sabotage, and triumph. All right. Good image, lots of primary colors, straightforward imagery. Uh, we go right into the description. Defeat your opponents round and round by building the highest stack value cards or thwart your opponent's mains with Diva Strategy. So, it's like War in that you whoever has the highest wins. But unlike War, where it's just card by card by card, which just, just goes on interminably. And does everybody hear my local obnoxiousness? All right, I'm breaking protocol. It's not water. It's Diet Coke. Don't hate me. I know I've accused... <clears throat> Uh, colas of basically being brown dishwater, but I it really cuts through the phlegm for me. Sorry for being honest. So instead of the the one after one after one, you actually build up a a, a little group, and then if you uh, draw a war card, then you go into the battle. Um, there's a couple little more elements to it, but at the end of the day, it's straightforward. Here you go. Um, so like here, you can have equipment. That you can add, which can increase yours, or can you know other ones will decrease uh, your enemies. So like there's characters. I also love that all the characters look like the uh, the road sign people. You know, <laughs> I think it's a great design. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so see see right here, the snake is a bad draw, um, but perhaps you can inflict that on somebody else. Right? They think they're doing great, and then wham, you hit them with a, a beehive. You know, and they were they were only beating you by one. Now you're winning. Um, okay, I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> uh, I guess nudity gets a four. <laughs> All right, so here is my one caveat about this thing. And that is, there is the snooze edition. It's the same game, apparently, but just with a different palette. And I got to tell you, I'd rather have this one. I like it. I mean, don't get me wrong. This, this has its place. This has a very play school vibe, right? And that's great. But man, you know, I'm the guy that always switches his, his phone to dark mode, right? That's what, you know, uh, you can't tell cause I've concealed it up here, but I am living in dark mode in my browser here. Um, so, you get, well, let me make this easier for you. <clears throat> you get uh, the deck and the instructions for 25. And then for 47, you can get both. Um, and that is the my only disappointment with this. I would I would rather there be a choice. You know, if you're going to offer um, two, if you're going to offer two things like this, um, I mean, it's not great Kickstarter-wise to have two identical things because then you're 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 manufacturing two things. Um, so that's not great to begin with. So I can see why they went with this, where no matter what, you're getting the main one, but then there's just going to be some extras. And I think is it limited? Uh, for that one. Yeah. So they have a limited number that they'll do. <clears throat> it's a tough call to make. Um, but, I mean, honestly, in the end, you're supposed to be making these things for the people, right? It's the you're, you're aiming for fans. So not giving me the option to just get this disappoints me. Uh, because I'm not going to pay for two of the same game. So that's a, that's a mild oversight. Not a big deal. Because like I said, this still looks great. You know, and in fact, I mean, it's more geared towards playing with a kid, which you're probably going to be doing anyway. You know, this is not uh, a complex uh, all night game with your your favorite uh, war gaming buddy. This is just, you know, quick 10, 15 minute thing and you're done. But they need some love, you know, and just the main deck here. Twenty five bucks, you know, let me scroll it down for you. Because I'm terrible at this. I should just pull my fat head out. There you go. 25 bucks, you get the game. Uh, yeah. I, su I support them. I hope other people do. Next up, we have Goodbye Ghosts. 
So, right off the bat, let's go. Let's just let's just hit that that elephant in the room. I'm really hoping that Bandai Namco does not issue a cease and desist because wow, that is just straight off the Pac-Man screen there. Um, anyway, this is Goodbye Ghost, a cute, fun, quirky card game for two to four players. Print and play edition. Um, wait, we'll come back to that in a second. Uh, image, great, clarifies what's going on here. Hey, we got a deck of cards. They got this kind of back. What it is, it's Uno. It's essentially Uno. Um, instead of numbers and colors, you have faces and colors and you know but then some unique uh, special abilities you know special cards that do things that are different now see this is okay so I, I yeah we are going to come back to this because it's not just a print and play there is a printed one in a deck box so it's not just a print and play edition so for 22 I'm sorry I keep doing this to you 22 you can get a uh the full game in a case printed out for you and that's the way i would go because i first of all i don't like printing things out but if i'm going to print something it's going to be like a print and play roll and write not a bunch of cards because you need a particular stock of paper so i would never uh print and play a card game also i found it's really difficult to get companies like, if you were to provide them with a PDF, it's really hard to get companies to actually make cards because they're all concerned that you don't own the rights to this and that they're going to, you know, and that you're, like, you know, reselling it. Um, so there's all this legal crap that you have to deal with uh, in order to print cards. I have uh, <laughs> I have researched heavily trying to make special Marvel Champions cards because I want for like my main the character card that just sits there uh, I want it to be like comic book art instead of the the art that they come with it would just be cool if it was like a comic book cover and that's the way they make some uh, cards like that if for promos and uh, you know booster rewards for game nights um, but I I can't create one I mean I could make it in Photoshop I could create a Marvel Champions card, and then, but I can't print it because I don't have the card stock, and you can't send it to somebody to print it because it's copyrighted material. And even if you promise it's just for you, they they often won't do it. So that's the issue that I would run into with the print play here. Um, what is also going on here is they have other games that you can back. I don't know anything about those games, and like I said, this is basically Uno. It's pretty straightforward. You know, it's just a different version of it with, you know, slightly more uh, or slightly different uh, special abilities. It's cool. It is currently... So it's getting made, but like I said, that, I mean, these people, this is what? This is going to pay their car payment for two months? You know, they're putting in a lot of work here. Let's Let's see if we can get them some love, guys, right? All right, up next, we have, here it is, the Thunderground pick of the week. Oh, man. And you know what is absolutely horrible is uh, about this is that I now have to hit you with, uh, I'm hearing an issue with my feline, and I have to attend to it.
Okay. So the cat's fine. She's just an idiot. And she was upset that she wasn't allowed in here. And so she ran around, knocked over something that closed a bedroom door on her, and she couldn't get out. Yay. <sighs> the pleasures of pet ownership. All right, so our Funny Ground Pick of the Week this week is something extra special, folks. Thunder Rolls, the garage expansion. I, wow, I, I'm going to go on at length. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just going to warn you right off the bat. <clears throat> All right, so we'll do the, the breakdown. Hey, Thunder Rolls, the garage expansion. More mayhem, cars, and fun for the Thunder Rolls game by Richard Launius. Okay, here we go. We got the image. Uh, I mean, I guess it kind of tells you. I mean, obviously, cars and fun, it's a racing game, and you can tell that it's a racing game. And then it gets, well, kind of gets, it gets into it well enough. Okay, here's the thing that you don't know. I tried to launch Funderground Games two years ago, and the original Thunder Rolls was a pick of the week back then. <laughs> and so you cannot, you, you just don't know how much I, how happy I am that as I actually launch uh, Funderground, that there's a callback. They're coming out with an expansion. This is awesome. So let me tell you uh, about Thunder Rolls. So it's a racing game. Uh, duh. But, <clears throat> here you go. Now they got a neoprene mat instead of boards. So here's the way this thing rolls. Sorry. Um, <laughs> eight cars going around the track, right? Every turn, so you have dice. The first turn you have uh, fewer dice. The second turn you get all your dice. You roll all of your dice. You pick one of them, whatever number it is. So, you know, if you rolled two twos, two fours, a five, and a six, you pick any one of those and you place it on the corresponding spot. One, two, three. You put it here in one of these, in the, the top row, unless there's other dice there. We'll get into that. And then you take the action that this represents, which often has two actions. Uh, and I shouldn't say often, but... There are there are options here, and sometimes you get to do two things. Also, which is not shown here, underneath each one of these cards, uh, the, under these each one of these locations are three cards, and you see these little arrows. If it's a, a black arrow, that means it's face down. If it's a white arrow, that means it's face up. <clears throat> Why does this matter? Because after you've expended all of your dice, you then go through each one of these sections. And whoever has the most dice on this option, so if you put, you know, four threes, so if you took the three action four times, so you got four dice lined up, and then the next guy only did it twice, that means you're in first place on this. You get first choice of the three cards underneath. Do they show an example? I know they do. Boom, 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 boom. We just keep going until we get... Yeah, so here's the cards. <clears throat> so you get first choice of the three cards and then whoever had second place gets second choice and then the third place gets whatever's left and then anyone else gets nothing okay now <clears throat> these cards allow you to do things and you will organize them in a certain order of your choice the next during the next phase where those cards activate well I went past there where those cards activate and the reason the up or down, you know, f facing or, or back matters is because that means you get to see the cards that are there, which gives you kind of an inkling. Do I want those cards? Am I going to fight to to use this to get those cards? Now, the game itself is crazy. You, It doesn't seem like it from here, but I promise you. These vehicles, jockey position, constantly shifting, crazy stuff happening all the time. You, like up here, you use six, you get to move two spaces. But then 
um, if you draft, right, and there's two cars, it's like if this car was in here and the red car drafted for two, all three cars move forward by two. Then you can cross over, which is if you're behind a car, you move in front of it. However, if the car you're moving in front of is not the lead car, if it was, if there's another car in front of the car you're crossing over, then you have to uh, roll to see if you get it. And if you roll higher than them, you get in. If you roll less than them, you don't get in. But if you roll the same, you actually get knocked back one space. Then you can side draft, which is where you're up against a group that are drafting. You can literally push them back. Um, you can and uh, you can uh, force your way in from the outside. And if you win this, and again, you do the same roll mechanic, but then if you do that and you get it, you then shove everybody in that line backwards. Um, there's so much happening. And then however many of you are playing, there's eight cars. Well, whoever isn't, whichever cars aren't being run by a person, there are, there's an AI deck. And so after everybody rolls their dice, the first time so you do it in in it's a draft thing you roll so it goes in order of pole position whoever's in first place starts and everybody puts one die down they roll the dice everybody picks one die takes the move and then the artificial intelligence runs and the way that works is they pull one card from the deck and then they do it and if they can't do it nothing happens so but the ai different cars have different tendencies so they're interesting and they can do some crazy stuff like, in, you know, they, they will dramatically alter everything that's happening as well. I have seen it happen where someone is basically lapping another car and then they still end up in third place. OK, there is <clears throat> there is, so many things happen. So then in the in the second round, you get uh, well, in the second phase, you use the cards and then you go into the next. And so every round of this is supposed to represent, I think, 10 laps in this. And then there's also look, there's another race. And then also each one of these racing boards has this space here for a special card that introduces unique rules for that race. So on top of all of these things that are happening, there's also like an environmental factor. Um, and then, <clears throat> you know, some of these abilities down here, like if you use the crew chief, then you can also like take back one of your die that you place somewhere else, giving you an extra roll. Um, or you can take a card. And then if you, when you use, when you draw all these cards from the, from underneath the, the actions, you see these little hazard icons? If they have a hazard icon, you have to roll dice to avoid trouble. Because if you if you don't, if you fail, then you know bad things happen. You get knocked back, moved out, uh, various and whatnot. There is so much going on here. This is a great game. Now, one of the biggest complaints about the original was that when there were multiple AI, the game became a slog because you had to run through all of the AI cards. Now, I personally think uh, that the solution there would just, you know, okay, like I'm going to just confess, I don't know jack about racing, really. I mean, I know that Rubin is racing, but I really don't think that Robert Duvall is like the arbiter of all things NASCAR. Um, and I think the only other, uh, I think the only other racing thing I've ever watched was Wacky Races, which is absolutely not an accurate interpretation of the sport. Um, but <clears throat> I am confident that uh, in some kind of race, I don't know if it's the NASCAR or what it is, <clears throat> but there is some race where there's teams, right? Like, like a, a group puts in multiple cars and they assist each other. So I always kind of felt like the solution to the AI slog was, you know, just like two or three hand the, the cars, you know, I'll take three, you take three and then the AI will be two, right? Gives you a whole new way to play the game too, right? <clears throat> well, apparently with this expansion, they solved this. They made better, faster AI and, I think I'm hoping this team owner factor leans into my multi hand option. Um, so yeah, 
Now, here is the last element of this game that I love. Let me show you. There's an actual animation. Here you go. You customize the cars, right? Which is great in and of itself, right? You get the colors on them because you got to put colors on them because you need to identify them because you, you obviously you need to know which car is yours, but it, everybody needs to be able to quickly identify and your dice will match your car color. So, you know, just a little cohesion there that I really like. <clears throat> but here's the extra special. The sponsors are legit sponsors. Like, look at this. This is Board Game Geek. You know, Dice Hate Me, Geek Dad, Mr. B Games is the people making this, Arcane Wonders, Tantrum House. These are, so that's a pledge level. Let me get my fat head out the way. <clears throat> right here. Oh. Sorry, I should have muted that. Uh, $139, Sponsor of the Garage. You get a copy of the expansion, and you get to put your logo on the sticker sheet. If you don't think I got my eye on that, you're smoking something. I, like, mm, I would love to see the Thunderground medallion on a car on this game in my house. Oh, that'd be great. And hopefully it's in everybody else's house. Great, right? Now, I love this. I think this is a great game. Uh, the original one succeeded, obviously. Why would they make an expansion if it didn't? I'm an idiot. Uh, but it it only hit like 34,500, right? This is a fantastic concept. But seriously, you, like, look up a video of this game being played. It is fun, okay? Now, they have already been successful, but... Hey, we're not, this is why it's the pick of the week. This is something special. I really, really think that these guys deserve a shot. Uh, if you can do it, please do. This is a fantastic game. Uh, this expansion makes everything even better. Um, yeah, all right, moving on. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, yeah, there you go. <clears throat> so that was wrong. All right, I think I figured it out. Let's try it. Let's see. Ah, there we go. So, this is... Oh, man, did I leave? I just realized. I left Ghosts Up the entire time I was talking about that. That is so sad. My apologies to Thunder Rolls that I left there. I left the ghost bug up in the corner oh and didn't i promise you that i would screw this up and i did all right we're going <laughs> i left that thunder dog logo up there this is not a thunder dog so <clears throat> and of course let me fix that with a click and some loving and boom i told you i'd do it <clears throat> So, and my apologies to Thunder Rolls for leaving uh, the ghost bug up. I'm sorry. Uh, however, I think I was effusive enough to have actually made up for it already. All right. So, these are not Thunder Dogs. These guys are, most of these are already doing fine. Um, I just found something interesting that I thought, and, you know, while I, I, my major focus is small, uh, creators, you know, it seems silly to just ignore everything else that's happening. So I pick out a few things that are of interest to me. So wild earth dice, the liquid core collection. So we'll do our rundown. Does it tell us what it is? Yes, it does. Wild earth dice, the liquid core collection. Obviously there's liquid in the core handcrafted luxury dice sets. Um, okay. So these are weird. I don't love most of these. To be perfectly honest, uh, I don't like the water one because too much of the interior is obscured. Um, I feel the same way about these desert ones. Um, yeah. Um, but there are there's a couple things about this that are really, really neat. Um, one of them is okay so the cherry blossom one not my preference but in motion because it's like got this uh glitter in the interior it 
it kind of makes it look like, you know, cherry blossom leaves falling, falling in like a samurai movie. Um, so the one thing I really like, these four-sided dice. That is clever. I don't know if I'm highlighting. Am I doing something that's going to make you notice it? I hope so. Um, <laughs> I think that's neat. I like that. I like that design. Obviously, it's uh, functional over form because they need to get the fluid in there, and, and it was probably next to impossible to get it inside the you know traditional tiny little four-siders. Um, and the other thing I love are these. 85 millimeter super chunks. Look at the size of that beast. Holy heck. Um, however, here comes the secondary factor, the, the wince factor. Oh, 130 pounds. So what is that closer to? Uh, 150, 160? Let's take a look. I'll do a real quick check on the side if it, nope can't do it so you gotta buy those these are add-ons okay so the shimmering seas one I like it's just pure clear acrylic love it this one I like even more cause it's like it's clear acrylic but it's like it's not even tinted but the interior like it's this rainbow fluid that's cool am I paying $150 for a die not on your life no one giant die versus several games, not even a question for me. Uh, particularly a die I'm never going to use. What are you going to do with that? Also, to be honest, I don't even know if these are legal because they have a moving substance inside them, right? I'm not saying that it necessarily would affect the roll, but the potential that it could probably means that if you're in a you know some kind of tournament setting of, of some kind, they're probably going to be like, eh. Um, I like this one a lot, too. Look at that, that green interior with the clear exterior. And then this one is just more like the original, just different uh, ink. Yeah, this is, I don't know. I mean, if you're into if you're into dice, this is, uh, oh, here, we'll give you the, there it is. You can see the little stuff moving in there, right? Oh, we'll give you the, was there a, did they do, a, no, they didn't do one for the cherry blossom, so you could see it. But this is basically the same thing, Right. In fact, it is the same thing. It's basically the cherry blossom design, just with green instead of pink. Uh, here we go. There you go. You can see it. See? A little shifting in there. I look at things like that, and all I'm thinking in my head is, okay, to shoot that, someone must have shaken that thing up as hard as they could, set it down, and then jumped away so they could roll footage. <laughs> and how many times did they try, and, it, and they... We're too excited, and it rolled down the front and knocked all those freaking dice out of the way. Ugh. These are the problems when you work in production. You're always worried about how something was made. Uh, yeah. So this one, oh yeah, the Crimson Spire. I don't know. It is what it is. Uh, if you want to get a set, a, a single set is, okay, so here's the ugh, secondary element. Single set is 25 just to reserve a spot. The actual price for just the Cherry Blossom 8-piece, $90, but that does not, that only gives you the 8-piece set. You do not get the, sh the a chunk, right? Chunk is, you know, and the, the different chunks have different price levels. In fact, I think all of the, the dice have slightly different levels based, I'm assuming based on uh, the difficulty or the amount of work put into the, the exterior. Um yeah, and this actually harkens back to my point. See, we see the little foam water. That's not consistent. There's an air bubble in there. That that has to affect, to some degree, the roll, I would imagine. Um, but yeah, it is what it is. <clears throat> Love it, leave it, but it's interesting. Uh, if I mean, if I had cash to burn, I'd go ahead and get that uh, that one chunk. the Either the green one or the clear one. That looks really cool. Either that green one or that one right there. Those would be my choices. Uh, but, you know, it is what it is, right? If you like it, you like it. It's something It's something out there. Um, let's go to the next one, which is Dragon Dowser. And so we have left behind the, uh, the world of accessories, and we're into a game. So... 
this is a interesting game uh, concept. Quick breakdown. Of, uh, of course, someone's mowing their lawn. Why wouldn't someone in the middle, in the hottest part of the day on a Friday, why wouldn't you decide, hey, let me let me go get heat stroke, but heat stroke with really nice smells, right? Because I love the smell of, of fresh cut grass. So let me go, you know, see if I can shorten my lifespan a little bit. You know, why not wait until the evening, you know? Or why didn't they do it earlier today? No, right in the smack middle of the day. I would say, why are they home? But anyway, I apologize for the idiots in the background. There's really nothing I can do. We're just going to, uh, we're going to drag on. So, uh, doing the assessment, rescue and rear dragons in the solar punk table pop R- tabletop RPG for one player. This is where I got caught. I was like, what? Um, and solar punk. I don't even know what that is. Uh, I want to, it, this is this seems interesting now conceptually okay so we got great art here really really like the style uh they're leaning into one of my favorite things heavy exterior lines that will sell me every time um and then they go straight into it here it is dragging out a solo journaling game using carta i got to assume carta is a method of this like like fifth edition is a, is a version of Tabletop RPG, Carta must be, I don't know, you know, don't at me, just, you know, be nice and let me know. Uh, However, the way this works, you're supposed to find a dragon, there's four potential dragons, as you use cards, decks of cards. I know, there's a lot of decks of cards going on, and also decks of cards with traditional suits. It's a strange day for cards and suits. Um, So you, you get one of four dragons, the, the different dragons have different uh, personalities, though I think you can affect that to a degree. And then, you know, you're going to save the world, right? Because you always are. Who's ever played a game where all you, you're, where you're a coffee barista? Um, do I need to say coffee in front of that? Probably not. Anyway, um, so here you are. You got your four suits. Now, what you do here is you have a certain amount of resources. You turn over a card. There are prompts. You... you react to the prompts you write it in a journal you're basically creating a story is my understanding which that's cool right i i will state definitively that if you have a a kid that is like just feeling out their uh creative muscles this is probably a fantastic way to help spark that imagination you know because every one of these cards comes with prompts and then uh, based on the cost of the card, so the higher the card, so from you know king downward, king being the highest, obviously, uh, I'm going to assume that the eggs are the aces. Uh, the king will cost you the least amount of resources, uh, or in fact, it looks like it actually gives you resources. Okay, but then the lower the number, the more resources it consumes in order for you to inter- interact with that card. Then you got to give up some resources just to move. And so basically you work your way through it's I mean is it a game sort of uh it it feels more like a a really advanced writing prompt system and that's okay. Um you know, you're going to tell a story. Um I guess my only complaint would be that it's all the stories are going to kind of be of a type, right? This is just this is just going to be dragon riders of Pern forever. <laughs> but, um, but hey, man, she wrote those books for a long time, so you know, it could work. Um, but I love the art and the concept is a it's a great idea. And like I said, if you or someone uh, you care about is trying to spark some creative juices, this is a great great methodology um now let's take a look at the pledge levels so 13 dollars gives you the pdf and an an ambient music track i don't care about music tracks in my kickstarters you know if you like that awesome uh 37 gets you the custom card deck and the soft cover so this is basically this would be my entry point right here 37 dollars, and you get the game um, now at $50, they toss in this over here, 
this. They give you a custom foresight. I don't. I'm sorry. I don't feel that that uh, warrants the cost. If this is extraneous. I don't really think they even should have included this in the. Um, I'll just stop. Anyway, great idea. Uh, if I. <laughs> <laughs> but but let me just say this about that. Let's take a let's take a look here. I saw a really good image. Uh, no, that's not the one. The card backs have it. There it is. There it is. Here's the the image that I want to dig into. Let's see if they have a. No, they don't seem to have it anywhere else. That's fine. Um, I want you to take a look at this image. Okay. And now I'm going to show you another image. I own this game. And one of the reasons I bought this game was because this game, the design looks a lot like... Huh. <laughs> huh. What are, are we... Are we... Are we noticing some... Some similarities? Huh? Are we? <laughs> uh, I'm not dumping on them. Uh, I just find it, it's just so weird that like every time someone, like we got a D and we got a crystal, I guess we're going to make the dark crystal. Like there's a letter D in our title and we have crystals. So, I mean, somebody already did it gr perfectly. We'll just do that. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm <clears throat> I wish I were British, then I could I could say with some legitimacy that I was just taking the piss. Uh, but you don't believe me because I didn't say that with the proper accent. Uh, but they're doing okay. But it, I mean, uh, <laughs> vague potential graphic design plagiarism aside, uh, which would not hold up in court at all. As I just demonstrated, there's plenty of stuff that already does it. Um, it's interesting. Um, it's a neat idea, and it has its place, and and beautiful, absolutely beautiful, absolutely beautiful art. So, that's a big selling point. You, it it would be attractive on your table when it's when it's happening, you know. Whether or not your handwriting does this game any justice. Eh. <clears throat> All right. Next up, we have the Medusa Report, which is quite a different. Uh, little thing here. Uh, they're doing well. Yeah. As they should. This is one of those uh, mystery in a box games. And I got to tell you, I want to do one of these. I think conceptually this is great. I mean, can you imagine, you know, hey, well, I was about to say, let's order some pizza and do the thing, but I am a hardcore sleever and I will, I will put a foot in your chest if you pick up my game components while you're eating a greasy ass pizza, mm -mm, no, sir. <clears throat> Sorry, I just had a flash with someone doing that. It just made me angry. So, but hey, have some friends over, uh, bust out the mystery, get some drinks, have some fun trying to figure this out. This sounds like a fantastic night. Um, I've seen these things like there's mail order versions and then there's like the subscription service that'll send you like one every quarter or something. I can't even imagine how much effort goes into creating this mystery. But I got to tell you, if I were to if I were to ever create a a game, this would be in my top five for the, the kind of game I would want to make. So let's do the breakdown. A thrilling tabletop. Oh, thank God. They sh you know. What you don't know is uh, there's an extra layer to the mowing the lawn thing because I refuse to mow lawns. Like ever since I m left my parents' home, I have literally never mowed a lawn, and it's been a while. I won't do it. I've I've lived in two places where it has to happen, and I have uh, in in one uh, we paid a service. And then in the other, it was my neighbor, and I got them a bottle of uh, bourbon every month. So they would just, when they were mowing, they'd just come over, because my yard, not very big, 
Just do that. It was a great arrangement. I will not mow grass. I hate it. It is the most tedious, mind-numbing event. And because it's so freaking loud, you would have to damage your own hearing if you were to try and do anything else, like you know, listen to music or podcast or something. So, yeah, I want nothing to do with it. Anyway, <clears throat> sorry for that aside. They give a great... A thrilling tabletop puzzle adventure about a missing spy, a nuclear physicist, and Cold War family secrets. This is right up my alley. I really like this little this zone. The only thing would be better if it was some kind of uh, uh, Blade Runner esque thing. That'd be the only thing better for me. I, I don't know. I love the the old school spy vibe. You know, you're digging up through this mystery. Love it. Okay. Here's the other factor. Oh wait. So first, image. You know. I mean, I don't know. I'll be honest with you, this maybe isn't the best version, best image that they could have used. You know, this thing with the stuff out, that might have been better. Um, interesting, though, we got Bond and Ian Fleming over here. Ludlum. They're clearly selling a vibe. Uh, and then we go directly into it with a great description of what it takes. Now, here's the here is, they didn't fail here by not giving us more of a description because they can't. It's literally part and parcel of the game itself. You can't describe what's happening in there because it ruins the event. Uh, but that is a double-edged sword because it also means we can't know if it's any good, right? It doesn't have traditional mechanics. We can't be like, oh, well, it's a worker placement and I can see the meeples and there's a lot of slots. It looks like there's some, some good choices you can make there. Read a couple elements of the rules and you can see that there might be some hard choices and some mechanics at work. Nope. It's all out the window. You can't know squat about what's in that box, which means this is a shot in the dark. And which is... In and of itself, it's not quite as much a shot in the dark because these people made other things. Uh, well, they made one other one, but it did really well. Um, but the other element of this that <clears throat> I think needs to come in, needs to be a factor in your thinking, is that if this is too easy, it's not going to be that fun, right? But if it's too hard, like, who are you going to go to, you know? Who's gonna? Who's making the like? You know, this is. There's only like eight, nine hundred people that are getting this. There's not gonna be some massive community out there, you know. Now there may be some Discord or something that you could get on, and you know, people help each other out or whatnot, you know. But if it's too hard, then it like if you're if you're going into Discord and you're doing stuff like that, then well now we're like now we're into AR games, right? Where it it the game itself exceeds the the bounds of its uh, physical space. Um, but my point is, if it's too hard, <clears throat> it's going to be discouraging and you're not going to have as much fun because you might not even finish it because you're supposed to be able, it says here, you know, two to three hours. So you're supposed to get it done in one sitting. Okay, but but that floor of too easy and that ceiling of too hard creates a band, right, of accessibility. But the problem is that band is predicated on the talent the insight, the intelligence of the player, which means that band is sliding all over the place for everyone. So I don't know how you hit a sweet spot on this. I don't, uh, which probably is why I'll never make one of these. But I don't know how you hit the sweet spot. Maybe if you make a bunch of these, you do. Uh, I'd love to hear thoughts from Diorama um, on this concept. So that's my breakdown. Uh, I'm still absolutely would love to try something like this. You know what I mean? I'm just, you know, I have a healthy bit of skepticism on how much I'll enjoy it. Uh, anyway, here's a little thing which you've probably noticed if you're actually watching this instead of listening. There's a f <laughs> freaking, this is a, a seven inch floppy over here. What the heck? Or is that five and three quarters? What is it? Yeah, so five and three quarters. Sorry. There's a floppy. Okay. I don't have the technology in my house to read this. Is this part of the game? Do I have to source an old Commodore to, to be able to actually parse this game? There's my neighbor's dog. I don't know. Uh, that would be interesting. 
that would definitely be some real AR element to this game if you had to do that. I hope not, though, because uh, I don't know if I could find one. <clears throat> but I like the look of this. You got the little pouch. It feels like, you know, you're, you know, you got these photos. I have no idea how this thing breaks down. And I don't even really want to look too much in the, in the event that I might, uh, be able to play this. Now, here's the, uh, the final thing that I want to say is that this is a non-destructible version of this, of the game, right? A lot of these, you know, uh, escape games and mystery games, they require you to, you know, write on things or tear things or do, do something that makes it that you can only play it once. This does not. So after you play it, you can give it to somebody else. And that is doing these people no favors, right? Like, I don't know how many sales they're losing from that. Um, but I got to imagine, you know, well, probably not. It's probably great for them because then it's making a new fan. It's, this is actually, you know, from a marketing strategy, I think that's the, the, the angle they're taking. And I support that, you know, you hand this off to somebody who doesn't know about these things or is unsure and they try it and they love it. Wow. You got a new customer, right? That's a solid ploy guys. So what is the cost? 50 bucks. Absolutely reasonable. And then one copy, including stretch goals, estimated retail price, 65. I don't care about that. I wish they'd stop doing that. Uh, obviously there will be shipping. Uh, it seems sizable, probably looking at like 20 bucks in the U S uh, 2025. So, you know, it's going to be a $75 game all told, but you know, five people, playing a game you know one night five of you 75 it's not that bad right you know what is that 15 bucks a, a person it's cheaper than going to the movies um this seems really cool let's move on <clears throat> if i knew how there we are and up next we have murder on the moon um <laughs> <laughs> which uh, <clears throat> is actually another one of these games. <laughs> I'm not going to harp on it. We just did that. Let's do. Let's just do the breakdown. Murder on the Moon and Immersive, immersive Puzzle Adventure. Blah, blah, blah. Puzzle Adventure. Uh, escape Room in a Box. that combines puzzles, technology, and a thrilling story to help you solve murder. There you go. Uh, that is clear and concise. Uh, we got a video. <sighs> I don't love this still image. This little... Uh, transparent thing here it's not it's not my favorite design um you know but it, it gets the point across here we go story <clears throat> play now back what we have seen on bbc dragons and again they can't really tell us much about it because it's a mystery um and they're hooking us with hey you get a mini adventure immediately that's kind of cool um and hey they were on BBC Dragon's Den, so we got a pedigree. Uh, Murder on the Moon. I okay. So, like I said, I can't really speak to any of the stuff. So, and I, I think I've said everything I, I need to say about these types of games in the previous one. So, I just want to point this one thing out here, and that is, you get a map and you build 3D elements. So you build the <clears throat> the location up which helps you know create the the scenario and and helps you to figure out what went down that's awesome i love the little physical element to this that is really cool um now here's the thing that i don't love <clears throat> it has an app and i haven't really talked about that much here i am not a fan of any game that requires an app particularly a kickstarter from a small developer because there's no way they're going to support this thing long term you know so a couple of operating system updates from now this thing is toast and i and you can't possibly be expected to keep archiving technology you know like buying new tablets and never updating the old ones so that you can play all the you know and use all the apps that are existing like the little time capsule of app uh, status. That's absurd. And I say it's absurd because I'm currently doing that. <clears throat> I have a game 
and I have a tablet that I haven't used in years. And that tablet really, its only purpose now is that it has apps on it that play one or two games and I will never update the thing. And eventually the battery's just going to completely kaput and I'll be screwed. Uh, but I won't update it because I, I don't think that those games, I mean, they stopped supporting those games. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm aware of the issue and I hate it and I will not do it again. That's why I stopped playing, uh, X-Men miniatures because they switched to an app based system and I will not participate. So, uh, that said, I doubt you're going to get a game like this and let it sit on your shelf for eight years. Also, you're really only going to play it once. So the app, as long as you play this thing within the next year or two, you're going to be fine. Um, and that's pretty much it. I do like that. They, in the app, they do this like ancient tech, like we're going back to, you know, Windows 98 here. Um, that's pretty cool. Also, uh, I didn't even, we didn't do, how much is it? Well, roughly the same as the other one. 56 bucks. There you go. Same, you know, same, same. Uh, oh, wow. So you can get the entire series. So what does that run? Boom, 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 boom. Name of the game, Murder the Moon, Countdown to Chaos. Is this it? Oh, no, that puts you in the game. There it is. Woo! Okay. $525 to get it all. That's not cheap, folks. <clears throat> no siree. Uh, and, I don't know, like I said, you're going to want to play these soon. Um, they're doing okay, though. They got 430 backers, so clearly they know something. Uh, I think it looks cool. Like I said, I don't love the app thing, but also I don't think you're going to be waiting to play this thing for 10 years. So it's not really a big deal. Um, and I like the, the the map with the little 3D stuff, right? Who doesn't love that stuff? Moving on. <clears throat> Our next one is Ruse, Instincts of the Den. I'm sorry I didn't. Uh, fill that in completely because it just took up too much space and the bug wouldn't work. So, Ruse. Uh, I really, this is very interesting. Um, again, they're doing okay. Okay, Fox theme, Euro style strategy game. Unique design and worker placement, territory exploration, resource, and dice management. Um, there, there's some uh, copy issues in this uh, Kickstarter. Uh, but they're minimal. Again, everybody, proofreaders. Uh, I like this image. It gives you a great idea of the play space. The box looks great. This is really good art. Fantastic. Uh, it gets right into it. Boom. Here is. Though it's really just a recreation of that. Um, all right. So, it's a fox-themed board game, and I love a fox. They're cat dogs. I think they're awesome. Uh, apparently, they don't smell great, though. They have some kind of gland thing. Uh, so they're very, they're very musky. Uh, so I'm not sure if I would really, they would need to be in like a bed. Obviously you're not supposed to have them as pets, but you know, maybe I just want to be a Disney princess. Sorry, I just ASMR'd you. Apologies. I shouldn't have crossed the, the cardioid field. Um, I like three things about this in particular. <clears throat> One, these little tiles that uh, that you interact with to play the game are interchangeable, right? You can, you know, they'll be different with each game. I, I think I don't actually know that. I believe that because <clears throat> otherwise, why do that, right? Secondly, they're canted at a forty-five degree angle. There's no reason to do that other than to make a cool design, and I love it. <clears throat> That's great. So hats off to the to the graphic designers. Uh, the other thing that I think is really cool, this little tracker over here, uh, is keeping track of your kits. And by that I mean baby foxes, not gear. <clears throat> it's keeping track of your kits as they uh, develop and become more capable. And then the last element of this that is fantastic is these bags contain little tiles 
that you use to slot into this double layer board to build your den and add elements to the den that your kits can go through. This is, there's so many things going on here, right? And then the whole time there's like a hunter out here and uh, that you got to avoid. You're earning points. You're exploring these locations. Uh, <clears throat> and as a, a last piece of excellent uh, design, this, the rule book for this is pristine. Really, really well done. Like, <clears throat> this is, it was seriously very professional, looks great, very clear, outlines everything. I am losing my voice. What is going on? Excuse me. <clears throat> there you go. That, well, sort of. Uh, we're, we're getting close to the end, though. So, and it has a solo mode. Okay, this, this seems pretty cool to me. I like this. The, the visual design's great. <clears throat> All the elements look cool. Uh, nice job, guys. Uh, let's take a look at the cost here. <clears throat> 88 bucks. Yeah, I mean, it looks pretty heavy. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on. Look at all this. I mean, it's no joke. Um, yeah, this thing is probably going to be like 130 on the shelf. So this is, if you want to do it, this is the, the time to do it. <clears throat> All right, so what is up next? Oh, yes, that is right. <clears throat> Sorry, didn't mean to do that in your ear. Uh, evolution, uh, another world. Oh, hold on. Hold on. Something's not right. Um, <clears throat> here, I won't bore you with that. Something, we had an error. Uh, huh. Stay with me. Boom, boom, boom. Okay. So, it's supposed to be Evolution of Another World. I don't know why it isn't, uh, but I'm going to fix that right now. <clears throat> Stay with me. Um, just takes a moment because I got to dig through, get into this uh, document file so that I can just oh, yeah that's weird that it didn't show up there <clears throat> no I just want to open it there we go all right let's slot it into place see <clears throat> something happened I'm, I must have clicked too early on something and it closed a window because uh, when I did the dry run this was here uh, that's okay so <clears throat> we are going to get back into evolution another world and boom here we are <clears throat> all right so create wonder sandals and give them traits to help them survive and thrive in the chaotic wind so this is uh, another version of evolution uh so they, there's been several of these this one i'm a little more interested in personally because it goes sci-fi <clears throat> yeah, traditionally the evolution is dealt with you know just stuff on earth this so i like this this first image i want to show you is awesome there you go so you get a ferret with anti-gravity mist breath come on how cool is that um <laughs> uh i have an evolution game oh also it has bat wings all right and the next one look we got magma rock crab turtle come on this is fantastic. Um, I own an evolution game that I have unfortunately not played. Uh, I have several different kinds of like I have several several games based on the concept of evolution. I have the evolution game. I have Darwin's Legacy. Uh, I have some game that's all about how the the what is it the Franciscan monk or whatever that discovered genetic the traits of genetics with beans. Uh, <clears throat> It wasn't on purpose. I don't. I didn't lean into uh, natural selection as a <laughs> a game style. It just it just rolled that way. Um, I really can't speak to uh, how the game plays, so I'm not going to. Uh, I just think that the art is fantastic, and it comes with a bunch of little tiny plastic tokens. Oh, I love a little gem token. 
Love it. <clears throat> um, yeah, and they're not, you know, wasting time with miniatures. Like, they're, they're, their production values are great. Uh, the art looks great. These things are fantastic. And they have a track record of making fantastic games. Everybody loves the Evolution series, so, you know, this is a no-brainer if you're into it. <clears throat> the reward levels is... Okay, there you go. 30 bucks. I guess not even that expensive. I mean, it is basically a card game, so that's reasonable. Um, and then you can get the special edition, which has all the Kickstarter, but it's only $15 more. So at 45 bucks, you get all the goofy extras. Uh, and Oh, so you don't even get stretch goals in the retail version. Huh. What are the stretch goals? Sorry, this was going to be short, <clears throat> but... Okay, so you get some evolution cards, you get some resources, you get more evolution cards. Okay, so it's all these different creatures and resources added. And a five to six player expansion, which is useless to me. I've literally never played a game with more than five, with more than four people in it. Um, alternative cards. From this expansion, even if you play in a smaller group. Oh, so you can swap in the five to six player expansion cards, but you have to do a straight swap. Uh, two additional. Oh, for the five and six player. That makes sense. A couple more extra, a couple more extra tokens. Which, you know, I love. Oh, you get a wooden first player token. Oh, and then here's the stretch goals. What do we got? A new trait. New trait. New source. Oh, upgraded tokens. Wow, so you didn't even get upgraded tokens with the base level one? Oof. Huh. Well, <clears throat> what are you going to do? Uh, it's only 15 extra bucks to get all the stuff. I mean, but that's literally what they're doing, right? That's what the, that's the that's the hook, right? At $30, they're basically, like, at cost, right? And then, you know, or just a little. The, the 45 the, all those extras are of minimal cost to them, right? It's just more cards, right? They don't got to design a box. They don't got to make another box, uh, you know. So that extra fifteen dollars. So of the thirty, you know, they're taking home, you know, they're they're profiting like thirty percent. But of that last fifteen, they're profiting like sixty percent. So they really, so they're pushing that by saying you don't get any of the cool stuff in the main one, you yeah, know, basic business practices. Um, hey, if you like evolution, this one's going to work out for you because <clears throat> it's the same thing, right? All right. Uh, huh. I just realized. Hmm. All right. So the next layer <clears throat> is we are going to be checking in. Uh, and our first check... So what we're doing is we are checking in with a previous pick of the week. Uh, and this week it's Cartref. Uh, they got two weeks to go, and they are still... Come on, guys. This was cool. Great concept. Uh, Well-designed. Yeah, this was... Oh, I remember... I really liked the setup. Uh, I don't love how hungry this is making me because that looks like Skittles. And I don't know why I suddenly desperately want Skittles. I generally don't care for Skittles. <clears throat> also, I only eat the green, yellow, and orange. Red and purple are for terrible people. Terrible people eat red and purple candies. Uh, actually, that's not true. Some red is okay. But, ugh, Twizzlers. I like Twizzlers and Red Vines, but no, I do not eat uh, the red. I never eat purple. No purple candy. Never. Ugh. Why would you? <sighs> Grape. Ugh. So nasty. Anyway, uh, yeah, come on, man. It's got a solo mode. I really don't want to like repeat myself here. Also, I barely uh, recall what I actually said, so I probably won't actually repeat myself. Um, <clears throat> but... You know, it's four bucks for a print and play. Uh, and then, what do we got here? We got the combo. Yeah, and you get, yeah, well, he offers a bunch of other stuff as well. Uh, they, they offer a bunch of other stuff. I really liked the, the look, the system, and 
at four dollars. Come on, only ninety three backers. That hurts me. That hurts me a lot. Come on, folks. All right, next one we're gonna check in. Sigil. How we doing, Sigil? All right, funded. Funded it a little over double. Two hundred twenty nine backers. Excellent. Sigil is doing great. Could still do better though. Really could. You know, this is a lot of love went into this design. Uh, I still think that the uh, the die lock mechanic is brilliant. If you weren't here for that, real quick, uh, you have to put f- you have to get five pieces to cast this spell uh, and three pieces to cast this spell. And if you cast it after you cast it, you lock it by putting a die, a six sider with the number one on it. So you have to wait a, a turn before it can be used again. <clears throat> um, and then every time you use a spell, you rotate the die to another number higher, increasing the amount of time. And one of the ways that you win the game is by playing a number of spells. So every time you play a spell, you make it harder to play spells. Great mechanic. Um, and I love the little glass beads. Uh, it's an underrated game component, I gotta tell you. <clears throat> but hey, they're, they're doing well. Uh, this game is filled with hard choices and interesting, uh, like you can, <clears throat> you can kind of hurt yourself in order to advance something. So, which is really just another kind of hard choice, but instead of it just being, which of these two things is more awesome? There's also like, Ooh, I don't really want to do this to me, but I really got to try and do that. So uh, really well designed, and then these uh, spells, uh, there are additional ones that you can swap in, so it'll change up the game and, and what you can do. And all the spells mitigate rules, so it's fun. And also, 39 bucks. Come on. Ooh, 64, and you get the neoprene. I think I would have to go with that. Yeah, gotta have that neoprene mat. Look at that. Mm. Yeah, I really like that look. All right. <clears throat> So there's that is, uh, they're doing well, but you know, they could do a little better, right? Now <clears throat> we move into the super funded games, which I'm not really here to expound upon at great length, but, uh, I feel that we need to show them, uh, cause there's some interesting conversations to be had around these things. Uh, first up is Carson city. So this campaign isn't actually for the game. It's for a special box. Uh, And this box, what's special about it is... There you go. Game trays inserts. I cannot speak highly... Wait, let me not... Hold on. Game trays is an actual brand. Let me not uh, state that that's the actual... Okay, I might have... Okay, it's not Game Chase. I apologize, Game Chase, if you're out there. Uh, you did not make this. However, <clears throat> this is of a similar ilk. Very streamlined storage of this game. And I gotta tell you, I've, I've never played this game. I watched it played once. Uh, and watching the cleanup was tedious. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Adam. Uh, the this is a dramatically better solution to storage because watching that thing try to fit in there, I was, I did, I cringed seeing the final state of the box. Uh, so this is a great solution, uh, which, and you get the upgrade. It's thirty-five pounds. It's probably around forty bucks. Um, oh, no, I'm sorry, that's euros. So it's still, yeah, pounds would have been like 40, more than 40 euros. going to be like 37, 38. Um, <clears throat> the, so if you own Carson City, I feel like this is kind of a no-brainer. This officially licensed giant box with its faux leather. You know, if you like Carson City, this is, you know, clearly, Adam, I'm talking to you. Um, I will say, uh, this, this campaign, though, you can purchase the game as well as the box. Right, but the, the the purpose of this campaign was really the box, but they're not going to pass up an opportunity, right? Um, the game itself, I do not understand this portion of the board here, this like land development thing. I do know that you 
acquire land from up here, you know, things to put there, banks, uh, mines, and really those are the only two things I know. Um, I do know that when you, like, I think you need to get uh, roads to facilitate uh, funds from these things. And, I, and the last thing I know is that if you own this location, if I put a meeple on it, then I basically rob you for that turn. Okay, so I can't help you here. I don't know how this plays out down here. Uh, but people love the game, so I guess it works. What I do know, and what I think is a fantastic mechanic, is that this track, this little Candyland track up here that goes around, snakes around, in everybody takes turns putting a meeple down to determine which uh, action they're going to take. And you can put your token anywhere. You can put your meeple anywhere you want on here. Uh, it doesn't matter any order or anything of that nature. However, when the when the round starts... You actually go through this track in order. So the order of where you place things does matter. Um, and you also have like a character card that you can use to mitigate some rules. Like I think the sheriff gives you extra uh, pistols and you need the pistols because uh, if you put another meeple, if you put a meeple, if there are two meeples on a space, then they are, then the space is contested and you got to do a duel. And then whoever has the most pistols wins. Um, the only thing about that is in the game that I watched, it felt like you kept the pistols, um, which I felt was kind of like a, a monopoly bully situation. Cause if you keep the pistols after the duel and you were the one that had the most, like then you're just going to rum roll everyone after that. You know, if, if you basically you get to win every duel that round, I mean, maybe that's the game mechanic and that's just the way it's supposed to work. Uh, but it seemed like it would be, more meaningful that you would pick and choose your duels because by going into the duel, you expend the pistols, thus making you less capable in a duel later, which would then, you know, mean that you would be very, very critical of where you decided to get into a battle, you know, or if somebody deliberately put a battle on you, then you might, uh, you know, pl place your token on the little, uh, pistols here to gather some more or maybe you'd go ahead and intentionally lose a previous duel in order to win this one i don't know uh i don't know i don't know how it works but i love the mechanic of it of after you place it anywhere you then have to follow the course of this uh path and do everything in order because it, it the way it cascaded was very interesting all right so enough about that <clears throat> We're going to go to, oh, that's correct. We are doing it. Oh, did I do it again? I left evolution up. I'm so sorry, Carson City. I am just terrible today. <clears throat> what are you going to do? I'm the worst. And then look, now I left Carson up during Monster Hunter. See? <clears throat> Someone needs to take my keys. All right. So here we are. Stronghold game. I'm sorry, Steamforge. Wow, was I saying Stronghold this whole time? I just need to shut up. <clears throat> so, wow, that means I screwed everything up. I am, okay, I'm going to beg your indulgence here for a moment. Uh, we're going to go full screen. <clears throat> I think I conflated something earlier that I should not have. <clears throat> No, I don't. There you are. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, did I get that wrong? <clears throat> Hold on. What? So basically, earlier in the news cycle, I told you about uh, Monster Hunter and the and the people who make it uh, cutting a deal with Kickstarter, <clears throat> and I may have conflated the names. Uh, of okay, so was it Stronghold or was it Steamforged? <clears throat> so let's okay, I can figure this out right here. I'm sorry for putting you through this. <clears throat> okay, so. 
we're good. My data was correct. I just used the wrong name. <clears throat> so my apologies to Stronghold Games, the, cr the publishers of Terraforming Mars, for using their name. It was this company that makes Monster Hunter World. Everything I said was correct except the name. So it's Steam Forged Games that laid off 20% of its workforce two months ago and has cut a deal with Kickstarter. Um, <clears throat> yeah, again, my apologies, Stronghold. Uh, not that you'll ever see it. So here we are with the Monster Hunter World Iceborne. So I have played this game. I not Not the board game. I've played the video game. This board game is a sequel to a board game that was an interpretation of a video game. This sequel to the board game is an interpretation of the sequel to the video, well, the expansion to the video game. This, however, unlike the video game, is standalone. You can't play Monster Hunter Iceborne without owning Monster Hunter World, the video game. So, uh, in an interesting twist, they really didn't go overboard, which surprised me. This is you can get the core, which really does have everything you need, for 81 bucks. These additional elements are a couple more monsters to fight, okay? Um, which does matter, you know, because, you know, if you're only fighting four monsters, eventually, you know. But again, you can get the full content, which really all it does is it doubles the number of monsters that you can battle. And some of them are, like, really huge. But, who? I mean... Like, that matters in this game. You know what I mean? The, the the size and weight of them has no bearing on what you do in the game. So it just means you get a giant miniature, which is a dumb thing to say out loud. Um, but at 158 bucks, when we're talking about these giant super-funded games, that's not bad, really. At the end of the day, for 158 you get everything. I mean, their original uh, Monster Hunter... Yeah, let's take a look. The original Monster Hunter. Uh, yeah, so their all-in pledge. That was actually only about two hundred and fifty bucks, two hundred forty. Okay, so the Monster Hunter. Well, I'll tell you what though, this thing at retail is insane. Um, however, <clears throat> uh. Let me see. What was the Elden Ring? So this is the most recent one where they made a ton of money. Look, it's 13,000 people at $3.5 million. So what's the big one? All-in pledge. There it is. There we go. About $400 once you switch it over. 400 bucks for the all-in. Oof. And honestly, the game itself was really just played out on this little map thing. It... I mean, don't get me wrong. Uh, I, conceptually, I thought it was pretty interesting the way they, they handled the, the combat. Um, but this was a heck of a lot of video game to try and shove into a board game. Uh, and I don't know that it succeeded, but I will give them some credit. They don't seem to be gouging as hard as others with their uh, content and price. I mean... what. Actually, that, I'm full of BS. Look, this game is a bunch of cards and a board. That's it. That's what the game is. You're paying, you know, more than half of the cost of this to get these stupid pieces of plastic. Look, if you want to paint them, great. Go ahead and do it. That this game is... I like the idea of the game. I love the idea of the, the you know, the Shadow of the Colossus style game. Like, I got Skull Hollow. I like. Uh, I recommended a couple weeks ago the Titans of something. I can't remember what it's called. Um, it's a Kickstarter tower right now. Where it's basically the same thing. You little dudes climbing on a monster. But in both Skull Hollow and in that uh, Kickstarter that's still live, um, in both of them, the the giant monster is the board, right? And and you're so you're climbing all over. Oh, sorry, folks. And so you're climbing all over, interacting with that. <clears throat> with this, you just got a miniature and you're shooting at it, right? You don't need the miniature. It doesn't it doesn't serve any purpose other than to look cool. You know, if you can't if you can't visualize this with, you know, a a standee. I'm gonna stop. 
So my other uh, issue with this is that it only comes with four uh, characters. And the reason that's a problem is because they have unique weapons. And this game is literally about the weapons. You literally... Um, wow, I'm saying that too much. <clears throat> when you play this video game, the weapon you choose completely defines your play style. And you become accustomed. And, you, and that is... It defines you in a sense, right? Like, like when you go and play with other people, it's like you literally like, is anybody a horn player, right? You know, do we have any bows? Do we have any glaives, right? You try and get, and so everybody usually has like specialties and then some strong seconds. So I'm a, I'm a glaive primarily. My second is the hunting horn and my third is a bow. Like those are my characters. I literally, oh, I said it again. I I 100% do not ever play any other of the weapons. And there's like 16 of them. Okay. But the thing is you spend weeks of your life gathering the, the stuff to make these weapons and build this armor. And so to go back and start over with a low level version of another weapon is not thrilling for me. Uh, also, you get so accustomed to the way you play that when you pick up a different weapon, because of the, the mechanics, it it is so dramatically different. It, like, you have to completely retrain your muscle memory in order to use that weapon, right? And that, But that's kind of the fun of it. Like, you know, uh, you, know you get an identity, you, you pick certain armor to, to look a certain way, and then you have a certain strategy every time you go up against monsters, and then everybody kind of relies on each other to do the thing they do. So... I don't like that you're limited because it means that in in this game you can only use these certain weapons. And so if you can't use the other weapons, and if that's not a problem, then that means that these weapons don't matter either. It means that the, the distinction between them can't be that great if they're not going to let you have all the other weapons. Um, and also at the end of the day, you're, you're just you're you are hunting things to collect things to make better things to hunt the things, right? And that's usually why I play I play Monster Hunter every you know, I played World, I played the first one, I played one of the intermediaries, I played World, uh, I played Rise. Uh, and every time I play for a while and then I I instantly fall off. It's a cliff. I just hit a point where like my brain is just like, you can't kid yourself anymore. All you're doing is beating up the same digital creature over and over for that because you're looking for that one claw you know that one wyvern tear that one piece of fur that you need to get that next weapon because you need that weapon to go defeat that creature that that is weak to ice and why are you why are you be, beating that creature that's weak to ice because you need the stuff that it gives you so that you can make the weapon that lets you beat the creature that's weak to fire oh sorry i just hit something like, and, and, it, and it just keeps going. Eventually, my brain goes, dude, you're just doing the same. You're just pumping the same thing over and over. You're not accomplishing anything. This is a cycle, and now the cycle is no longer fun. And then that's it. And it just, boom. and that happened to me with Monster Hunter Rise like two weeks ago. Uh, so, yeah. Um, but if you like it, <clears throat> here you go. But I'm telling you, the, this basic mechanic is available elsewhere. Um. Yeah, I'm curious to see, this is supposed to be like an action phase, and it, and just like in the game, you have stamina, and so by putting actions in a row, you use up your stamina, which probably means that in the next turn you can't do as much. So mechanically, there's probably some interesting stuff, but again, like I said, this is just a bunch of cards and a board, right? So a bunch of cards and a board is not $90. You're paying for the plastic. So <clears throat> let's move on to the next bunch of plastic. <clears throat> oh, I did it again. Oh, that was such a good ending too. And then I went right into screwing up. Well, I've got a brand. So Apex Legends, the boy. Okay. This is a bunch of plastic and this has one of the most egregious transgressions of plastic whoring. I have seen in some time. However, if you take the tier that doesn't have that, oh, okay. So, okay, let's do the breakdown. Apex Legends board game, Apex Legends 
I'm sorry. Let me give you the good one. Apex Legends uh, board game, highly strategic team versus team, miniatures board game for one to six players, includes solo and co-op. Boom! We nailed it. Um, <clears throat> this is based on a video game. <clears throat> okay, hold on. Let me let me make a fun point. <laughs> <clears throat> so here we go. We're gonna go down here, and the the big all in tier. Where is it? Is that the one? Oh yeah, that's right. So the the biggest pledge is two hundred and seventy four dollars. <throat> right there, there she is, the solo all in pledge, two hundred and seventy four dollars. For a board game based on a video game that's free. All right. Now I wanna I wanna go ahead and I'm gonna do one more piece of uh, mockery. <clears throat> so this is the solo all in pledge. Gets you everything. Gets you everything for 274. All the bits and bobs. There you go, including card sleeves. Uh, which you're going to need <clears throat> because this game has, where is it? Oh, come on. Don't make me a liar. Was I thinking about something else? No. Is this it? Oh, it's going to make me a liar. It is. Tag nab it. Uh, anyway, there's a lot of cards. We're going to move on past that. Okay. So let me get, let me, let me make my fun point here. My little joke. Uh, <laughs> The solo all-in pledge. Everything, $274. <clears throat> then, 253 the gameplay all-in pledge. Um, honestly, I don't even know what the difference is. Luba, full team, squad, one, two, supply. Luba, full team, squad, one, two, supply. Playing mat, card sleeves, and all unlocked. Playing mat, card sleeves. Oh, this has the solo and co-op. So the, all right. So, so again, okay. So I get to make the, this point twice. Awesome. So the solo all-in pledge has solo and co-op. The gameplay all-in pledge, right? The one that <clears throat> I'm sorry, the the gameplay that has the one that has all the gameplay uh, doesn't have solo and co-op, right? And then now we have for 172 we have the apex pledge. <clears throat> What does Apex mean? It's the top. There's nothing above Apex. It's literally the highest point in a curve. How are there two tiers above the Apex? Oh, wait. But there, there's a, not only is there two tiers above the Apex, but the next pledge, the gameplay all in, actually isn't. The all-in pledge. The all-in gameplay. The solo is. Ugh. So to you smaller Kickstarter campaigns, this is how you don't name your tiers. <sighs> Alright, so here's my here's my big complaint about uh, choices. Okay, mm -hmm. because I actually like this game. The game itself is good. I like that it, it's... Um, you can do teams, you can do the solo, you can do the co-op. Uh, this is fantastic. I like uh, that, unlike in the game, which is very Twitch-oriented, right? You got to move. It's like, it's just an onslaught. Uh, in this, you get to, you know, take time to make decisions, right? But the game puts pressure on you just like it does in the real game, in the video game. Sorry, this is a real game. Uh, with these, if you see these orange things around, this is the... Uh, the a active area, anything outside of this takes damage consistently in the real game and then you die. So you got to stay inside it. So it corrals you into a central space, forcing the remaining, the surviving players into tighter and tighter uh, areas, uh, making it dramatically more intense, right? It's the classic uh, battlegrounds, what is it? Ro Battle Royale method, which was pioneered by player unknown battlegrounds. Um, so you get that tension going on here too, which is great. And these, all these buildings and all this stuff, not only does this, you know, rearrange it also, if you look at the, 
thing. There's tons of it. There's tons more of it that doesn't fit. You got lots. You're going to build a bunch of stuff, right? And then you have every character has uh, their own deck of cards. They have their own unique features. But just like in the video game, the whole point is you got to get dropped into this area and you got to find gear. You got to find a weapon and then find better weapons and then find uh, attachments to improve them. So every time you play this game, you might you have no idea what's going to happen, right? Because you don't know if there's going to be any uh, viable weapons near you. Maybe the weapon doesn't work with your play style. Maybe the weapon doesn't have enough, the right attachments to make it what you need, blah, blah, blah. So we got all that going on. Uh, so I really like everything that's going on here. I like the little area of effect pieces that we have, you know, uh, with the little dudes. Um, I love that there's so many options for stuff to put in uh to you know to, to build out the the location this is great um i have nothing bad to say about the game itself i think it's great i have a problem with a pledge level issue okay so if we come down to okay so we'll go up let me get this to so there's a core pledge and then there is a gamer pledge. And there's literally a $6 difference, right? Now, they both give you all the stretch goals, right? But here's the thing. <clears throat> In, let me get down to it. So here's the gamer pledge for 85 euros, which is the $92 level. <clears throat> so you get all this, you know. Uh, core gameplay experience for all Apex Legends fans. Okay. So you get six characters, right? You get all their stuff. You get the little area of effect, blah, blah, blah. Great. Awesome. However, for uh, where is it? Okay, so over here, let me get my face out. <clears throat> but over here, the core pledge, which is $6 less, Gives you these stupid freaking dioramas. Here we go. Okay, you see this thing? You know what this is? This is just a piece of plastic that you stick your character in. So this is your character, and this is their little ability. Okay, and then on the on the front and back, there's this place to put cards, like to prop them vertically. Okay, this is that's what you're getting here with this core pledge you're getting this piece of plastic now why is the core pledge six dollars less you ask well that's because the gamer pledge comes with six characters but the core pledge only comes with four and it comes with less of the other stuff so look up here so you see these little tokens and you see this little area around here right now we're gonna go up to the Oh, look at this. There's more terrain. There's whatever these things are, right? There's extra tokens. There's actual, actually more gameplay and also two additional characters to play as. You get more game for less money because of the stupid plastic. So frustrated. I got to say, I also want to check, uh, can you purchase the solo and co-op separately? Is there an add-on for that? Because if there is not, then I'm out completely. Like I won't even recommend it. Because that, like, if the only way that you can have a solo and co-op experience is if you go into that giant, massive all-in. I am very disappointed. But if you can toss it in after the fact, on board when they are not showing add-ons. Holy heck! This is just this just keeps going. What does it say? Okay, I, I see that. I get what it does. Ha, oh my, I'm so sorry, folks. I really am. I I probably should check this. this oh, here we go. Finally, add-ons. There it is. Solo and co-op expansion. $22. Done. Done. So, for $110, you get everything I think you need. Right? Because you do that solo and you do that co-op. Uh, I mean, sure, it'd be nice to have more characters or whatnot. Um, 
you know, the two, the other two squads, it's another 60 bucks. I guess though, for another 60 bucks, it's $170 that you'd spend. And what do you get in that? But do they, but what is the full thing anyway? The, wait, the apex pledge has the solo and co-op. Well, there you go. And that's 172 full team squad one, squad two solo and co-op. I guess that's cheaper than piecemealing it. I guess you you don't get the Loba. Oh no, you do. Wow. So there you have it. Stupid piece of plastic thing, uh, preventing you from getting that. But like we discussed earlier, uh, the the extra pieces, the uh, the expansions are the, the where they make their money. Right, that core box has so much in it that their margin isn't that big. So if they can add on these extra, <coughs> excuse me. So like for example, in those add-ons, the so the core box is eighty. The add-on that just has three characters in it is thirty. There's an entire game with six characters for eighty-six dollars, but three characters cost thirty. This is where the margins come in. That's why they want these. That's why they want you to get all these uh, side pieces. So you're really making bank. You're doing the best. You're living your best life if you just get the base box and don't worry about the extras. Uh, and in this one, I would I would do this and just add the solo co-op and just live with the six characters. You know, sure it'd be nice to have all the others, but is it really worth it in the end? I don't know. <clears throat> all right, <clears throat> that I believe that was it. Well, well, well. What do you know? Uh, we did it. We made it to the end. And I only ranted about uh, Apex briefly. So if you get the chance, uh, hey man, like, right? Subscribe. Leave a comment. Polite comment. Um, we're going to be reaching out this week to all the Funder Dogs in the pick of the week. We're going to give them a the medallion. Uh, a digital file that they can use if they want to use it in their promotional materials. Uh, if you are coming up with a Kickstarter this coming week, maybe you'll get one. I would like to pass them out. I would like I would like there to be more people funding these. I would hope I hope that the getting a funder dog uh, medallion becomes uh, a means for people to garner more uh, funding and hit those stretch hit their uh, funding goals. Man. I, we want these smaller creators we want to get them up there. We need more of them. They're coming up with great ideas, a lot of interesting stuff, and they're not it, it, like this overburdened plastic stuff. I just, I could do with less. Uh, we really want to get you uh, new and smaller creators. Uh, this, the, we, want the, we want to shine a spotlight on you. That is our purpose here. Uh, and we're trying to make some moves, and hopefully... In the future, that'll happen. Hope you enjoyed the new format. Uh, this is, as far as I can tell, this is the way it's going to be moving forward. Um, I'll work out the kinks on the mechanical stuff eventually. But uh, I thought this went a lot better than it could have. So, thanks for stopping by, folks. And, yeah. I guess we'll be back in a week. Or maybe... <clears throat> I think it's less. It's actually going to be less because we got pushed so far. So, yeah, we'll see you next uh, Wednesday, I think. Might be Thursday, hoping Wednesday. But thanks for stopping by and leave a comment. <laughs>